Susan. Um, our agenda is pretty packed tonight uh, with five items. The last two items will be presented jointly with the Transportation Committee, um, and we welcome their members here tonight. Uh, but before we get started, I have some housekeeping items to take care of. Firstly, I want to welcome Josh Cohen to the Parks team. Welcome, Josh. Um, secondly, I want to communicate an invitation from the Broadway Mall Association um, for tomorrow night's lighting up of the malls at 5 p.m. at Verde Square. Uh, there will be seasonal treats and performances, so try to make it there if you can. Uh, and finally, I want to thank uh, Daniela Alvarado for taking the minutes tonight. Thank you very much, Daniela. It's a tough job, but thank you. Um, and now let's get started. I think Roberta is here, right? Yes, I'm here and I, I won't take very much time, but thank um, you. we appreciate all the hard work that the Parks Committee does every year on the um, budget priorities and the district needs statement. The district needs statement for fiscal year 2023 has been submitted to um, city planning. And I believe Max that it's going up soon on our website. Um, so you can all enjoy the great read. Um, actually, I do recommend reading it. it. It's interesting. And for the coming year, which will be fiscal year 2024, we will um, be doing two things. One is we're going to put as much information into our Airtable database as possible so that we can track things. For example, you've asked for a playground um, upgrade at Frederick Douglass Playground. We can actually track to see whether that's been done, when it's been done. Um, you can track something that happened two years ago to see whether that's been accomplished. Uh, additionally, we're going to prepare a form for each item that, that Harks needs to work on. So you, instead of doing one long report, you'll have a form to follow. And I'll take any questions if anyone has them. When is all this due, Roberta? Oh, the end of June. So this year, because we don't meet in July and August, we want as much information in June. We will be voting in September on the budget priorities. So there will be uh, at steering, which is the third Tuesday. So there will be a little wiggle room. So if the parks department comes back to you in August or beginning of September with an item, we can always add it, but we'd like the bulk of the work done in June. Thank you. Any other questions? I don't see any hands raised. Uh, anything else, Roberta? I think that's it. Okay. I know you have a lot, a lot to discuss tonight. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for being so brief. Okay, appreciate it. Thank you for coming tonight, Roberta. Uh, you're welcome to stay. <laughs> um, so let's move on. Um, the second item on our agenda is uh, to be presented by Caitlin Holt and maybe Lane Adonisio from the Central Park Conservancy. It is an update on the renovation of the Harlem Mirror project. Go ahead, please. Hi, I'll start off. Hi, everybody. Lane Adonisio from the Conservancy. I'm here with my colleague, Caitlin Holt. Um, we're going to do um, just a brief update on the progress on the Harlem Mirror project. project. And then um, Caitlin is also going to talk about um, uh, our plans in terms of the operation of the facility when it when it does open, um, when it's completed, and um, and our programming um, both of the Harlem Mirror facility and um, and connected to a kind of our our current programming up at the Harlem Mirror. So we'll give an update on that as well. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully this. Okay, um, is everybody seeing my screen? Great. Yes. Okay. Um, so this is a project um, I think many people are, are familiar. We presented this project back, um, uh, went through public review on the design um, back in 2019 into 2020. Um, I think as many people know, um, we are well into construction. Um, and just a kind of a quick 
brief overview for those who um, may not be familiar or, or refresher for those who um, who are. Um, <clears throat> this was the, the former facility, the Lasker Ooh. Pool and Rink um, up at the north end of the park. Um, uh, at the corner of the Harlem Mirror. Um, the existing facility was built um, within the curve of the drive, um, really kind of filling that the entire space um, at the southwest corner of the Mirror um, and um, was built in the 60s and had kind of a, a pretty dramatic and, and somewhat devastating impact on the park, um, on the park landscape and hydrology and kind of circulation through the park. And um, the facility that's under construction now, this is just an overview of the design of it. Um, a longer, uh, narrower uh, pool, um, and the building is actually tucked into uh, the landscape. Um, so the idea with this project is to really integrate the facility, which had sort of sat on top of the landscape and disrupted um, the natural systems, to integrate it and reconnect the natural systems and the circulation. So um, the lock comes from the North Woods, the stream course will reconnect to the mirror, uh, the, a path alongside it. Um, and as I said, the building is kind of tucked into the topography. Um, the the as it is as it was um, when it was the last girl pool and rink the previous facility it will be um, a swimming pool in the summer you can see the pool um, the uh, building tucked into the landscape so it will be a swimming pool in the summer that will continue to be um, operated by the parks department as a public pool um, after the the swimming season after the pool season um, there will be um, a a riser system installed in the pool basin so that um, so that a uh, a usable outdoor space um, with a sort of a synthetic outdoor carpet can be put on top so that this will become usable outdoor space uh, in the um, in the seasons between uh, the pool and the rink which will be installed on top of that during the skating season um, so um, we'll really kind of go from having a facility that was open for a couple of months um, uh, in the summer um, as a pool and for about four months um, uh, or four and a half months in the winter as a rink previously. But then for almost half of the year, the previous facility was just kind of empty and unused and that whole space was unusable. This will be um, a year, year round uh, facility. Just to kind of quickly go through and give you kind of a, a glimpse of the, the progress on the construction this is as we were <clears throat> in uh, September of last year so September of 2021 preparing uh, to demolish the facility and some images of um, of the demolition of the former pool and rink really a massive site and um, this work took us through from uh, September um, through kind of the early part of 2022 just to demolish um, the uh, the previous facility and then really starting to redevelop and regrade and reshape the landscape um, and uh, and kind of create the site to squeeze the building into um, into the landscape what you see here um, along the edge of this would be the where the drive comes up, what you see here is the uh, the back wall of the new facility. Um, after we sort of excavated uh, to create the, the space for the facility, the back wall, um, and this is uh, kind of our supportive excavation wall um, being constructed here. That will be the re the back wall of the of the new building. Some more images of that that wall. Really a massive site. I have to say, um, you know, it was a really huge swimming pool but as it um, as it was demolished and it's it's come out the site seems um, you know really huge when you're when you're on there you even get a sense it's much bigger when you when you're on there um, that rear wall and we're it's getting exciting we're getting to the point where it's really becoming you know this is the rear wall wall of the building we're starting to have you know waterproofing coming in and so we're starting to see the the beginnings of um, of the building um, just some more images. And then uh, in the last uh, couple of months, um, in early October, um, those of you who've been up to the mirror may have seen um, this structure going up. This is a temporary coffer dam going into the mirror. This is to um, 
to enable us to uh, dewater, remove the water from the part of the mirror that's closest to the site so that we can rebuild the shoreline and make that connection to, uh, the, to the restored stream course um, uh, coming from the North Woods. So in order to do the work on the shoreline and that sort of expansion of the mirror and connection to uh, the restored stream course, um, we um, had had to um, create uh, add this temporary dam, temporary coffer dam. Uh, this you can see it from the other side here. So this is from the uh, the construction site looking north towards 110th Street. Um, and what you see here is uh, these two these two pipes are carrying the flow of water from the lock in the North Woods under uh, the temporary dam as we dewater, um, have pumped out the water from, uh, from this section in order to be able to do the, the work of um, restoring the shoreline, removing sediments and do the, the, uh, the shoreline and water body work um, here. So this will, this will be um, in place um, through kind of the early part of next year into early spring while we, while we do this work. And in order to, um, to do that, um, we do uh, what is called a fish rescue. Um, so as we um, are lowering the water, kind of slowly um, and carefully pumping out the water, um, our staff, and this is under the, the oversight of um, the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, um, we, uh, we lower the water and we use these seine nets to remove the fish from this side to the other side. Um, uh, of the temporary dam. Um, so just uh, the, to kind of recap, um, this was uh, the, the facility in September last year, right before we were preparing to demolish it and um, skip ahead to last week. Uh, this, is the, this is the site today. So that's our progress. And you see the, the temporary dam here, you can see as we're, we've been dewatering this area. Um, Really, a, a lot's happened in the past year. Um, it's it's pretty exciting, and we're we're getting closer. Um, the uh, the uh, date for the completion and is for the uh, summer of 2024, um, which the pool season. Um, and, and so it's um, you know we're well on our way, um, and we're going to start. We're going to start to see. You can see this the wall back here. We'll start to see the pool in here and the building kind of tape, taking shape as we also work to restore the stream course connection from the mirror back into the North Woods. Um, and just did want to also um, note um, for those who use the drive and are in the park, you may, you probably are aware of this. Um, last week, um, we did um, shut down this portion of the drive, which will be closed for uh, the next two weeks. Um, uh, the the goal is to um, is to reopen it um, uh, the end of the week after next. So uh, December second is that Friday is the goal to reopen it. Um, we have detour signage. Um, so as people are coming up the East Drive, um, directing people to the West Side and to points north um, along this route, uh, and with signage kind of pointing people north once they get to Central Park West. And I will turn it over now to Caitlin to talk a little bit about, um, about the operations. I will say that when we were going through um, the public review a couple of years ago, um, uh, those of you who were around for that um, may recall, we had talked about the Conservancy's hope and intent to, um, to operate the facility um, and for it not to be a concessioned facility um, as was the previous facility. And i um, happy to report um, that we, um, we do have an agreement uh, with the Parks Department. So the Conservancy will be operating uh, the new facility um, year round, except when it is a public pool, it will still be a public pool operated by the city of New York. So uh, the city of New York will um, will operate as a public pool in the summer. And uh, other than that year round, it will be uh, a facility operated by the Central Park Conservancy. And Caitlin will talk a little bit um, more about that. And Caitlin, do you want to um, share your screen so that you can operate that? Yes, that would be great. So let me take it over. Um, thank you so much, Lane. And here we go. I'm gonna do this. All righty. Does that look okay to everybody? Good. All right. 
Um, so nice to meet you all. My name is Caitlin Holt. I'm the Associate Director of Interpretation and Programs here at the Central Park Conservancy. I'm going to start with just a very quick um, overview of the operations and um, programming that we're starting to think about for the Harlem Mirror Center and, and really just piggyback on what Lane shared already. But just so you can visualize um, what the operations calendar used to look like um, in the old facility. Um, as Lane said, you can see that there were about six months that um, the facility was not in use, that was used for transition time between the summer pool rink and, um, and then the winter ice skating rink. What we're really excited about is under the new operations calendar, you're gonna see a lot more public opening time. We plan to use the transition between the summer and winter seasons to offer more space for the public to use. Um, and then that was really that green turf that Lane showed in the image earlier. Um, so in here, we've, we've managed to take almost six months of um, unusable time and we've narrowed it down to um, approximately a month, a little bit less than a month of time that the facility will not be in used um, just for a very quick turnover between the rink, um, the green space, the pool, and then back to the rink. As Lane mentioned, um, in the summer, the pool will be um, operated by the New York City Parks Department, but in fall, spring, and winter, um, CPC will, will physically operate, I should say. We're gonna operate the, the facility all year round, but the, the parks will run the pool, um, and then we will, we will facilitate running these other seasons. So in the fall and spring, you'll have the outdoor space. Um, we are already thinking about programming and tours and perhaps educational, um, um, aspects of um, that space that could be used for the community. Um, in the winter, we plan to um, offer free and low cost public skating. We're really um, planning to prioritize community based programming. And as such, we've already been in touch with a number of community organizations, especially those that have a vested interest in the ice season, um, ice hockey in Harlem, figure skating in Harlem, Central Park North Stars and others. We're really interested in prioritizing the space for the community and making sure that it's actually a lot more accessible um, to our local communities than perhaps it had been in the past. So please stay tuned for more on that. Um, we're, just, we're just in the beginning stages of thinking through that. But while you're thinking to 2024, I'll bring you back to our current programmatic offerings. Um, for those of you that may or may not know, I'm sure a number of you have been on our programs even here um, in this meeting, but we offer a variety of programs for the public. Um, our guided tours happen um, most days of the week, they are delivered by our professional Central Park guides. They're actually the only tours in Central Park that directly support the park. I don't know if everyone's uh, aware of that, but our official, we are the only official tour operators in the park. And as such, we have a lot of different tours, tours that are perfect for um, the first time visitor and for the person that lives and goes into the park every single day. Uh, we've started to um, offer a much more diverse uh, selection of topics about things that interest uh, our everyday New Yorkers as much as they offer a primer in Central Park history to the person that's visiting from overseas. And we hope that you all will join us on these tours. Something else that we offer for those of you that maybe can't quite see yourself getting out in the winter is our virtual tours. Our virtual tours are actually all free. Um, we have a suggested donation, um, but they enable our neighbors who perhaps can't physically come into the park as well as those who live far away to join us. Um, during the pandemic, our weekly walks became a mainstay for everybody to feel connected uh, to the community, to the park, to see what was happening. And we hope um, that you all will continue to join us on our virtual tours and share them um, with your friends and relatives near and far. Um, these are 45 minute tours and, and they you know, reference different highlights of the park, but also some of those um, interesting and, and unique histories that we're bringing to light through our guided tours as well. Next, uh, we have our Discovery Walk for Families. These are our family um, focused programs. They're very hands-on. Um, they're meant, uh, you know, for those with children, I'd say like roughly to five to 12 years old, although younger children are always welcome. Um, and they, um, you know, kind of explore some of the 
the lesser seen areas of the park, the parts of the park that we can have interactive activities. So our woodlands, of course, our water bodies, um, but they're just a really fun. And I, I suggest even in the dead of winter is if you need to get out with your little ones for an hour um, and you just don't know what to do, I definitely come to these programs. Um, these are uh, free if you, um, if you sign up on the day at the location that they start, or um, you can secure a reservation in advance for a very small nominal fee. So we'll be offering a lot of those also during our breaks, our school breaks. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen our signage in the park, but we actually have an audio guide. And this audio guide was officially rolled out last summer. I'm pleased to, um, to share that we're continuing to expand on this audio guide even today. It's offered in multiple languages, um, English, French, Spanish, American Sign Language. Um, and it's, it's super easy to use. You can either call into the service uh, to find out about a landmark or an interesting aspect of the park, or you can download the Bloomberg Connects app for free, um, and you can um, listen to the audio guide that way. You can also even listen to them from home. Um, you don't have to physically be in the park to hear um, about the history of the park. So I just wanted to suggest that to everybody as well. And then we have a number of community engagement um, activities all throughout the park. Um, namely, this one here is our Harlem Year Performance Festival, which has just concluded its 30th year um, on the north end of the park near the Harlem Mirror. Uh, this is a festival is much beloved as a tribute to um, our local Harlem and East Harlem communities in particular, but also um, you know, welcomes musical genres that you might see um, up and down the east and west side of the park as well. Um, we also have a number of youth basketball clinics, free youth basketball clinics, uh, chess clinics, our Juneteenth in Seneca Village, and this highlight that I'm going to um, just bring up here, which is just coming up, our beloved hol holiday lighting ceremony, which is actually taking place next week. Um, families are, you know, again, encouraged to come. It's free. Uh, we're going to have singing uh, carols and hot cocoa, and I believe that there might even be a special gift I'm um, sorry, a special visit, I should say, by someone who will be giving out lots of gifts soon. Um, so we encourage you to come to this and all of our community engagement um, programs, which are always free and which are really um, for our communities on um, that's around the park. So on that note, I'm going to uh, end there. And I thought uh, we could open it up if um, if those if people are interested to q and I'll stop sharing my screen. And um, yeah, there we go. Okay, I think um, uh, anybody who has a question, please raise their hand. Ken, you can go first. Okay, thanks. Um, I had a question for Lane and for Caitlin, uh, one each. <laughs> um, the, uh, I noticed that the exit from the East Drive to Lenox Avenue lane is, um, is closed. I thought it had been open for a while. Is that a permanent thing now? The exit from the East Drive to Lenox Avenue has been closed um, since the the start oh, yes. of the of the construction project. So, um, so uh, that is that is related to the project. And when you know, at, as the project is wrapping up, it will it will reopen. Um, okay. It's it's construction access and our and um, all of our staging and um, basically in order to not have trucks kind of drive you know all the way through the park by say coming in at 102nd Street we we uh, determined that it would be less disrupted to use that entrance for construction access. Okay, that makes sense. Um, and, uh, and Caitlin, um, the, um, uh, I was just wondering if the city taking over the um, facility, um, I guess during the, uh, uh, the winter um, would, uh, uh, as opposed to having a concessionaire, will that save the city money and what about youth hockey? Um, I can speak to that that as well, okay. Ken. Um, um, so the city is not taking over. The conservancy is actually going to be right Sorry. running yes. running the facility instead of a concessionaire. And um, and you know the the reason for that it does it does mean that um, that uh, the well the reason for that I should say is that. The conservancy want wants to be able to run the program with a, as Caitlin said, a you know kind of a community first um, approach. And so when it's run by a concessionaire, um, when when facilities are run by a concessionaire, um, the concessionaire 
basically there's a negotiation and um, and the concessionaire is looking to um, to kind of their bottom line and what what they are going to you know, be able to get out of the facility. And so the goal of the conservancy running facility is that we can we can subsidize. Um, you know, the, we can subsidize the cost of providing programs um, and of making access more accessible, more, more low cost and providing programs that are free or low cost. So that was the, you know, that was the discussion that we had with the city um, and, and the basis for the conservancy getting a sole source agreement to, to run the facility so that it could be really, um, it could be really managed with an interest of, of, providing um, providing free and low cost programming. And so in terms of youth hockey, we have been um, uh, really for a couple of years now um, uh, engaged in uh, working with Ice Hockey in Harlem, which is kind of uh, the community-based youth hockey organization. Um, there is also a, a group called the North Stars, which is special hockey um, and, uh, and Figure skating in Harlem actually started at Lasker and kind of got pushed out uh, by um, by all of the hockey at Lasker, and so we're looking to kind of you know bring them back in. So um, so youth hockey, and particularly with a folk with a focus on um, on the community based organizations, the local organizations. Thanks. Thank you. I think Susan had a question. Thanks, Natasha. Really quickly. Um, thanks so much for the update. Really appreciate it. Um, Curious when, if before the pro project is finished, we'll be able to actually get closer to the mirror for bird watching. I, I do want to point out that Black Crown Night Herons are thrilled with the um, the wall that's gone up. They're perching on those posts. They're very happy, but the rest of us would like to get closer. So when yeah. that happen? Yeah. So I, I mean, I think that is that is going to be the the work along the shoreline and that path is going to take us. Oh, you just moved on my screen, Susan. So I was like looking at you, and now you're down here. Okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so that, you know, that is going to take us, um, you know, well into 2023 um, to do that work because it is, it is all of the shoreline reconstruction and that the boardwalk, which once it's done will be an amazing place for bird watching and, and nature observation. Um, but um, that is, that's going to take us much of the way through, through the, you know, through the rest of the project. It's kind of the big piece of site work that there is left to do. Okay, good enough. Uh, one question, if you could possibly have like little windows in the fencing, that'd be really lovely. Okay, I'm going to talk to the team about that. Thank you very much. Sure. Okay, I think I see a question by an attendee. Yes, oh, is this, um, I see a question about the, when will the Conservancy reveal blueprints of the new facility, including, is that the one that you're talking about, Natasha? Yeah, no, uh, I see okay. a hand up by Michelle van der Kloon. Oh, I don't see that one. Is there something in the Q&A? Something? There's something in the Q&A, yes. So maybe I'll answer this one and then, yeah, sure. okay. So this question was, um, when, will, when will the Conservancy reveal blueprints of the facility, including formation, information on the number of lockers, restroom facilities, et cetera. So yeah, we, sh we um, can and should plan um, to do kind of a more in interior look and through, when we went through public review was sort of the broad strokes and the, and the exterior and, uh, you know, sort of discussion of the interior, which is essentially there's, you know, the, the, the space that opens onto the pool is this large gathering space, the restrooms and lockers and all the support space is all kind of behind that. Um, but, um, and I will say that in terms of the number of lockers and, and restroom facilities, um, that's dictated by, well, the restroom facilities are dictated by the, um, by the pool. There's the New York City um, and New York State Health Code um, prescribe the number of restroom facilities based on the pool occupancy. And I will say that the, the former facility had um, which was built in the 60s, had very, uh, very small number of fixtures in the restrooms in, in terms of toilet sinks at much less than is currently required. So, um, so you'll have, uh, you know, much more uh, commodious um, restrooms. Um, and the lockers are, um, are also kind of dictated by the, by the pool and the parks department. So there, there will be, you know, kind of, um, uh, you know, comparable to the lockers, um, uh, 
but an improved facility, the lockers that were there before. So I think um, we'll look to, to, you know, I think sometime, you know, maybe in the early mid part of the, of the year, I'll, you know, I'll talk to the design team about coming in and just kind of doing an inside um, look in a little bit more detail of what that looks like. We might want to actually, we'll, we'll talk about, we might want to actually do something that the Conservancy convenes so that we can get kind of the various community boards at one time. Um, folks who are interested, if people think that that would be, you know, that that's um, something they'd be amenable to. Um, Um, and I see another question, um, which was how long will the road be closed? And so um, it closed last week. It will be um, through the rest of this week and the following week, the week after Thanksgiving. And then we hope to reopen it at the end of that week is, is the goal. Um, and it, um, uh, the, the reason for, for closing the road is just, um, you know, we've been trying to work as much as possible in sections, but um, we're kind of at the point where, um, and working with talking to the agencies and DOT and the contractor and, you know, even kind of um, users of the drive that it will be less disruptive and less impactful in the long term to just kind of bite the bullet and, um, and uh, do the rest of the work that we have to do in the drive um, in this compressed period. And then I didn't, didn't see what, what the other question was, Natasha, that you were referring to? No, somebody had raised their hand and then I think they put it down again. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, I don't see any other hands up uh, other than the panelists or the attendees. Um, I do have certain questions that um, a constituent sent us. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to just send those to you by email okay. and then you can answer them. They were very specific questions about. Okay. Sure. So, and I'm not sure what they're about, so maybe you could send them to both me and, and Caitlin, yes. if that's possible. Great. Thank you. Um, all right. So if there are, thank you so much for coming tonight, both of you, Lane and Caitlin. Uh, you are more than welcome to stay on. There are like the last two items um, tonight will concern uh, Central Park, so you're welcome to stay, but I, I think it'll be a long meeting, so it's totally up to you. Well, I'm going to try to rush home and watch from there, so. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Caitlin. Right. Unfortunately, I'm going to sign off as well to be with my children, but thank you all so much for allowing me to present, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thanks. All right, so um, moving along, our third item is uh, to be presented by Margaret Bracken from uh, DPR about uh, Riverside Park. Go ahead, Margaret. Oops. Sorry, just getting my, my screen all lined up. Oops. Sorry about this. Right, is that good? You got everything? So good evening, everybody. Margaret Bracken, the landscape architect for Riverside Park. And I believe on the call this evening also is Steve Simon from the borough office, John Harold, the administrator of Riverside Park. I think Merritt, our president and CEO of Riverside Park Conservancy and Wes Hamilton, who's our park manager. So full Riverside Park contingent here this evening. So we're looking at um, a predominantly a paving project in an area of the park between the Henry Hudson Parkway and the promenade from approximately West 107th Street to West 112th Street. So this is the area of active recreation that is below the promenade. And this is actually one of the last remaining areas of that that has, has not been sort of restored in the last few years. We've got synthetic turf ball fields down there. We've got a new skate park down there. We've got existing basketball courts and all sorts of active recreation. And this is an area that hasn't been um, restored, has not been paved for a very, very long time. And a portion of it was actually used as a staging area when we built skate park. So now the time has come to sort of address this, you know, this area. So what we're doing here is we're kind of combining funding. There is a, a parks department, Parks Department initiative called State of Good Repair, which is basically basic paving, um, simple, quick paving project to pick up areas of our city parks, five, you know, five boroughs that are in 
for a repair and need just, you know, like a quick and simple paving project. So that works with one portion of this project, but then there's also a little bit more complexity to it and other aspects of the area that needs that need more sort of detailed work. So the Riverside Park Conservancy is donating more than half of the funding for this project in order for us to be able to kind of finish out the, this entire area. Uh, so. Sorry, I realized I wasn't on full screen there. So um, our goals with this project are improving the existing um, paving conditions and accessibility, improve site drainage. It actually drains fairly well. We don't have drainage problems, but any time that you have any kind of significant heaving or cracking in the pavement, you can end up with pooling and puddling. Um, also, there's quite a lot of um, pavement down in this area. There's quite a lot of asphalt. So we're looking at expanding the growing condition for some of the existing trees and reducing the pavement in some areas. You know, we find some of it to be unnecessary. The north end of the site, there is an existing bluestone step ramp that is in very, very poor condition. The uh, west side of the site, we've got an existing steel panel fence, again, in poor condition. And we would like to um, install some benches. There were originally benches in this area, but um, from the 1930s, but most of them are long gone. So um, on the right hand side, you see this area of active recreation between the Henry Hudson Parkway and between the, uh, the, the promenade, the more passive areas of the park. Um, these are kind of like our boilerplate slides. Although we are relatively close to the Hudson River, we're not in a flood zone there. So that is helpful. Again, um, out of any significant flood risk, storm water risk. Um, in Riverside Park, immediately west of the tunnel box for the for um, New York for uh, the Amtrak tunnel. And um, these are the areas of active recreation. As you can see from this image here, um, our site is surrounded by active recreation. We've got basketball courts to the north. We've got skate park immediately south. We have a synthetic turf ball field and more active recreation to the south. So it's a very sort of designed under Parks Commissioner Robert Moses as a sort of active recreation and has continued in that capacity since the 1930s. So this is what these areas were like when they were actually built. The synthetic turf ball fields were actually real turf ball fields in that stage. And the left-hand image, um, the top of the left-hand image in here shows the area that we're looking at today. I mean, this was not actually, this was more of a kind of passive seating area. It was an open area with benches and with um, pin oaks, most of which are still there. As you can see, immediately south, um, there was a playground or, you know, asphalt and swings, um, different from the playgrounds that we have today. So we're looking at this area here. Um, and this is, you know, this is our kind of um, the variety of activity that we have in this area. The field house in the top left and the basketball courts that were reconstructed by the Riverside Park Conservancy fairly recently, skate park, synthetic turf ball field, and all sorts of action at 105th Street where we have beach volleyball and swing rings, et cetera, et cetera. So this is um, the southern portion of the area that we're looking at. Although where you see the numbers in the bottom there, the one, two, three, it appears as if it is an area of open, open grass, open turf. In actual fact, it's not. There are three different roadways. The middle image where it says number two condition of asphalt is actually that area. So this entire area is either asphalt path or it's one foot square concrete blocks that, are, that surround all of those existing London Plains trees. You can see on the right hand side, you know, some of the drainage issues that we have there. They're not significant drainage issues, but because there's been a lot of excavation, trenching, et cetera, et cetera, over the years, we tend to get a, a little bit of standing water there. Um, as you go further north, there's a fairly open area. So this was originally the area that was the passive seating area with the benches. The benches are gone, but the pavement and the existing pavers around the trees still remain. So we're looking at the pin oaks here, and this is immediately north of Skate Park and effectively is entirely paved at the moment. And then going further north, Skate Park and but all of these areas are kind of flanked with asphalt paths and west of, um, of the open space in the center. All of the asphalt is in pretty poor condition. On the west side of one of those um, 
the, the asphalt walkways. You can see on the top left image there, the really, A, the poor condition of the fence, and B, who planted the tree right next to the fence or installed the fence right next to the tree. So this is a three foot steel panel fence that is completely embedded for most of the length of this particular stretch in these large mature surviving London plane trees. Top right, we have a drinking fountain. It actually works, hard to believe, but it obviously it's not in very good condition. And then running up to the north of the site, this is the existing step ramp. So this step ramp runs, runs up to the promenade at 112th Street and connects to the promenade. So it's sort of the northern access point to this whole kind of necklace of recreation. The southern access point is down at 101st Street. The northern one is 112th Street with step ramps um, in uh, various locations along the length of the, the recreation stretch. So um, there's a lot of trees down there. So we will be excavating with extreme care, a lot of hand excavation um, and a lot of careful work as we remove all of this asphalt to reconstruct this area. All of the trees that are planted in this area were planted in the 1930s under the Moses era expansion of the park. So we're going to be very careful and sensitive as we work around those trees. Um, looking at the existing circulation, on the bottom of this image here, down in the right, you can see this it's kind of these multiple as unnecessary asphalt paths and this entire area filled with these concrete blocks. We have circulation to the east and west of Skate Park. This is the largest open area here where we're, um, that is predominantly asphalt. And then the pedestrian um, walkway that goes up to the top and connects with 112th Street step ramp up to the um, up to the promenade. And the purple line here is the existing steel panel fence, which is A, in poor condition, and B, is not doing any favors to those trees. So this is what we're proposing to do. In the southern end, you know, basically the bulk of this project is replacing the asphalt, and that's what we're using our state of good repair, our parks department funding for. So we plan to narrow these paths a little bit so that we can improve the growing conditions of the trees. At the southern end, where we have three asphalt walkways, we propose to remove the center one and then also remove those, um, those concrete pavers and open up that entire area. This is an existing lawn on the south area of Skate Park. So this will be, now be an open area of turf. We plan to put some benches in, three on the north side facing Skate Park, three on the south side that are gonna be uh, facing the 107th Street ball field. All of the tree pits, the, this is an existing tree pit, the other tree pits will be kind of opened up to um, improve the growing conditions for the trees. Um, the central area is where we plan to sort of, you know, where we're planning some fairly major changes. I mean, this is a rare opportunity for us when we have a sort of fairly open space that is going to be really great new level asphalt. And we've certainly been hearing from the pickle, pickleball community that they're very interested in um, are introducing pickleball to Riverside Park. So this gives us a great opportunity to, um, to lay out this area and to introduce some pickleball uh, courts into the park. So what we plan to do, these two northern and the northern area and the western area, removing the concrete pavers and um, enlarging the, those areas and just putting mulch in there. So these, these will just be areas of landscape as opposed to areas of pavement. We plan to um, install some new benches, these new benches facing south and benches to kind of enhance the kind of like the whole pickleball experience there. The layout of the courts at the moment, as it stands at the moment, we've got approximately eight feet between these courts. I mean, we're in a, there's a lot of demand for pickleball and we really want to sort of maximize the opportunity of this area. But on the other hand, we want to sort of retain enough space between the courts, you know, um, so that there is, and we also, you know, we still need this circulation um, for maintenance purposes uh, around the perimeter of these courts. So we're working around existing trees. We're also working around existing draining structures in this area. So this seems to sort of um, be, you know, the kind of maximum layout that works in terms of the infrastructure in this area. Um, looking at the step ramp to the north, we've, we've done several stairs and step ramps in the last few years that have been funded by Riverside Park Conservancy. And these are two examples. 
So the existing step ramp in the north of this site will have the pallet basically that's a combination of two of these recent projects. We're proposing to put a bluestone riser and then the actual ramps will be will match the existing, it'll all be new stone, but it will match the existing layout in that it will have natural cleft bluestone pavers. And that we then add um, a handrail down the center of the stairs. So this will conform to our standard palette for these, for these bluestone stair reconstructions in Riverside Park. Um, looking at the materials here, uh, we have, as I said, we've done many of these stairs. So we now have a kind of prototype that is part of our palette. So this is the typical handrail that we installed down the center of the stairs. This is kind of modeled on an older bronze handrail that we have at Joan of Arc at 93rd Street. Because there is, in this instance here, there is a drop off both on the promenade level and then on the cheek wall for this existing step ramp, we plan to use um, this handrail here that is typical of the promenade and typical of recent reconstructions. So this will go along the side where there is any kind of um, drop off. And um, other materials that we plan to use our standard bench, our standard wooden concrete bench, for which we use in the Moses era, era areas of the park, the original um, fence detail from the 1930s. The existing fence is, is three feet, is just over three feet high, which seems a little pointless if you want to actually kind of use it as a barrier between the park and the Henry Hudson Parkway. So we plan to do what we did in this reconstruction in 2005 down by the synthetic turf ball fields, which is to add the higher fence there. So we'll have a four foot steel panel fence, a new four foot steel panel fence all along the Western side of the site. So this fenced installation and also the step ramp reconstruction will be funded with the Riverside Park Conservancy funding. Um, and I think that's all of our materials. I think that's everything. Thank you, Margaret. And I'm just, uh, this is Max. I'm just going to jump in for a moment. Um, I conferred with the co-chairs and um, we're going to ask for people that do have questions for right now, at least to not use the Q&A. Uh, we do want to leave that open for some pieces later in the meeting. Instead, please raise your hand. If you're a member of the uh, public, you can also raise your hand. If you're calling in from the phone, you can press star nine, if not star six. Sorry, I can't quite remember off the top of my head. Um, either way, we'll get you. And um, oh, I see a bunch of hands. So thank you. One, one thing I forgot. The um, drinking fountain, the middle picture here, the drinking fountain with dog bowl and bottle filler. That drinking fountain, which didn't look so great, will be replaced with the new drinking fountain in the center picture here. Thank you very much, Margaret. Um, I am going to ask um, for community board members if they have any questions. I see Polly. Go ahead, Polly. Oh, yeah. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you for such a great presentation. And I'm so pleased to see that you're doing something with the stairs by 93rd Street because they're so dangerous. Um, is it my understanding that you said you're going to also put railing on the sides, not just only in the middle to navigate down those stairs? Because it's pretty uh, challenging navigating down those stairs. Yes, correct. Okay. So this the stairs actually at 112th Street, though. Yeah, but I saw a picture of something at 93rd Street. Um, 83rd Street, yes. 83rd, that, that, okay. that, that one actually does not have a rail along the, the cheek wall on the side because there's no drop off there. Um, we're using that detail, you know, if you could conceivably fall over and there's a drop off on the, you know, on, on the park side of the wall, then we would put a handrail on that cheek wall as well. Right, and then my other question is about the asphalt pavement, because yes, the uh, Riverside Park is in desperate need of an upgrade. Um, so are you gonna use the same type of material that was utilized 80 years ago? And if so, how long do you anticipate it to last? Because um, those paveways buckle, like you said, because of the trees, et cetera. So are you using the same type of material? Yes, it, it is existing, it's full depth asphalt. A lot of the paths in the park, the older paths in the park, were not uh, um, installed to the sort of depths that we do now. A lot of times when we're removing the older paths, we'll find that there's a lot of cin there's cinders. They use cinders as a base material, and sometimes the asphalt isn't as thick. 
So, you know, it's what we call full depth asphalt. It's a pretty durable material, but it doesn't last forever. In this particular area, there isn't a lot of vehicular usage. So I think that prolongs the life of, of the pavement. Thank you. Can we lower the screen share? Oh, sure. Yeah, Jay, you can go next and then Alex Bell. Um, I. Yeah, I, I just had a procedural question. Is uh, is the questioning and voting on this issue just for the Parks Committee? Or for the joint? No, this item is just for the Parks Committee, but when we do vote on a proposed resolution, we will, of course, take uh, votes from committee members as well as non-committee members who are present. But this okay, is not the, the right the, item. The main vote is just for the Parks Committee. Yes. Okay, then I don't have anything to say. Thank you. Alex Bell. Hello, you'll have to excuse my voice. I'm feeling a little sick, but uh, for the uh, fence that extends along the Henry Hudson, is there any breaks in that fence? I remember as a child, oftentimes people would park their car in the pullout and then use that to bring cakes or you know uh, stuff to the ball fields. I'm just wondering, is that possible or the persons would have to throw stuff over the fence? Well, that's not something we actively encourage, I think. Um, I'd be happy for John or Wes to weigh in on this, but um, I think accessing the park via the Henry Hudson Parkway is probably not something we want to encourage. Totally. I, I can see how we, we want to encourage it, but I just feel that the, the people always find a way. I feel like they've been doing it for decades. So my concern is it's a four foot high fence, we may just get five foot ladders that are thrown against the fence kind of thing. So just something well, to think about. The um, Over the summer, you know, we have a summer camp down there, which is mostly based at 102nd Street. And I have to tell you, I saw parents uh, lifting their kids over the four foot panel fence there to from the lay-by to get them into summer camp, which I thought was not a very good idea. Thank you. I'm going to move on to the attendees now. I see Catherine Hedden, and after Catherine, it'll be Ira Gershenhorn. Just takes me a second, but go ahead. You should be ready, Catherine. Catherine, you've been promoted. Hi, um, uh, my name is Catherine Hedden. I represent USA Pickleball as the ambassador for Manhattan. I would like to say first, it's an excellent presentation. And I thank you so much and the Parks Department for um, including Pickleball in your development. I have a couple of questions um, with this. Uh, one was the Pickleball communities around Manhattan pretty much monitor ourselves, but would it be at all possible to have a shed where we could store our nets? Since we all carry our own nets through these parks, a shed, uh, St. Fartin's has a shed now and Central Park, I believe, has some space, but that we could sort of have a either a, um, a lock with a combination where, because um, we all work off of team reach and we're all in communication. So I was wondering if somehow we could have a small shed where we could keep the nets that we don't have to keep lugging them back and forth. That was number one. And number two, I wanted to know um, when Hudson River Trust is giving us four and I asked them how they're gonna regulate the uh, traffic with the people. And they said that they're gonna try to run it like they do the tennis courts and they're gonna have proper signage saying, please limit your play to two hours, please, you know, this and that. And I was wondering if you could possibly put up some signage because in our community, we have found that there are people that play for four or five hours at a time. Thank and you, Catherine. I think, I think we will give Margaret the chance to answer your question. Oh. Thank you. Go ahead, Margaret. So um, in terms of the shed, um, what we typically do in this sort of situation, I mean, uh, initially we're gonna start with the portable nets, I think. And what we would do in this sort of situation 
is is the same as what we do with skate park and you know our playgrounds and dog grounds and everything is we provide you know what we call a salt salt box you know it's a sort of wooden storage box um close to the facility where um you know with a lock on it so that you can store items in there Great. so you know we'll we'll sort of as we move ahead with this and once we get into sort of getting things up and running it's in all of our interests that you be able to assist us to take care of this facility oh, absolutely. so we would definitely find a location work on the sort of appropriate kind of container and um you know work with you to to make that work you know we we're 100 in favor of doing that in a sort of discreet and appropriate um container as to the operations, I, I, um, that is going to be, um, you know, I would defer to Steve Simon for, you know, what our typical um, arrangement is to this point. And definitely any kind of signage has to go through our, we have a parks signage um, template and, you know, we have to have signs approved and everything. So I, I think that that will be something that we'll work with you on. Do you have anything, Steve, Wes, anything further on that? Uh, well, I, I, uh, this is Steve Simon. Uh, I, I like that idea. Actually, I was thinking of, uh, of signage that says uh, you should limit your play to no more than one hour, but, um, uh, but uh, uh, we can talk about that. Um, but uh, it certainly seems as though there should be some kind of signage there. <laughs> I agree. Thank I you. have one one more quick question, real quick. Catherine, you have to make it. Quick. I'm sorry, that is actually um, the extent of our questions. We're just allowed one for now. All right. Thank you. Ira Gershenhorn. And uh, if people could just keep their questions very concise, we would appreciate it tonight. Thank you. Can you hear me? No. Yes. Yes. yes you can. Okay. Um, so my question is well, first comment. Thank you for uh, reducing the width of the pedestrian walkways. That'll be less asphalt. And is any of the redone pathways, are they using grid pavers anywhere or just more asphalt? Uh, no, we're using, we're using full depth asphalt. And we, have, we have vehicles driving in this area and also for pickleball, we need to have a level durable surface. Yeah, I've seen the uh, Department of uh, Environmental Protection using permeable pave pavers in Alley, near Alley Pond Park. They have very heavy equipment on that. And it seems like they've been doing it for many, many years. So we'd like to see a, at least a pilot of parks do something with some sort of permeable pavement here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next person is Joy Hecht, and then Tina Young, and then Peter Arnston. And uh, after Gail Lipman, we will not be taking any um, any more questions on this. Thank Sounds you. Sounds good. Joy, you're unmuted. Thanks. <clears throat> um, I was just wondering if you're going to be re uh, repairing what I think is a staircase just south of where the restaurant run, you know, where the restaurant is on the promenade. And just south of that, I think there's a staircase down to the bottom level. Is that which is blocked? Yeah, up. it's at 105th Street, right? Yeah, where, yeah. where the swinger rings are that were in that picture. Yes, this is good question because it's actually in design at the moment, and you'll see it here um, for the Parks Committee probably next month or something like that. You're probably aware of the fact, if you're in that area a lot, that we're reconstructing the stair at 102nd Street, which is by the southernmost synthetic turf ball field. So this is a similar reconstruction, same materials for both of those stairs at 105th Street. So there'll be, you know, one will be closed at a time. So we'll have, um, you know, it'll be a phased project. So um, good news well, the there. The 105th is closed now. Um, one I don't just think it's- north of the restaurant, just north, which is open. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure there's one just south, but it's closed. It's been closed. Well, there's they're symmetrical. So the restaurant yes. is up on the top and they're symmetrical. I wasn't aware the southern one was fully closed, but it might have been oh, closed is, recently. Yeah. Oh, I think it's been closed for a year anyway. I think. I could be wrong. But the all right. I is the question answered. Well, well if I could just add uh and Natasha and Sarah, 
uh, we, we're planning to ask you to uh, add to your agenda next month uh, a presentation on the reconstruction of that staircase. Sure, sure. Um, and Joy, you can come back next, next month for that. Thank you. Uh, Tina Young. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, um, I'm one of the pickleball organizers from Central Park, and um, we do appreciate you uh, putting up these courts for us. We are all very addicted to this um, sport, I would say. And I just wanted to let you know Central Park did give us a, a nice metal box, and it can contain all of our equipment, so we're very satisfied with that box. And I wanted to ask two questions, very small questions. Most of what I want to say is thank you. Um, how far is the drinking fountain from these courts? And number two, what can I do to get more involved with help, you know, with these discussions of these pickleball courts? Um, the drinking fountain is probably about a couple of hundred feet slightly. So looking at this, this is the area that we're talking about here. And the drinking fountain is sort of up, you know, um, on the north end of this area of basketball courts. So it's fairly, it's fairly close. And there's also a drinking fountain in the skate park. So there's, which is about equidistant. There's one slight further south as well. Um, at the moment, I think we don't have a pickleball community, uh, but you could contact the Riverside Park Conservancy if you want to sort of um, be, you know, get started there with working with the Conservancy to start a, you know, a user group for Pickleball. I think Merritt is on the call, so she might be able to assist you with information about um, how you can work with the Conservancy. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this is Merritt. I can just chime in and, and say, um, if you email info at riversideparknyc.org, um, and mention all of your uh, interest in pickleball, um, we will make sure that you're added to the list for updates as we form user group around that. Thank you, Merritt. Um, Peter Anston. Go ahead, Peter. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. okay, great. Um, thank you first off for letting me speak. Margaret, this is great. Um, thank you so much. Um, you should know that there will be a history talk about um, Riverside Park coming up next Wednesday at 6.30 through the Upper West Side History um, or the Bloomingdale Neighborhood History Group um, based on the new book, um, Heaven on the Hudson. Um, in any case, there's that. Um, and just wanted to say thank you. This sounds great and I'll look forward to seeing it and hearing more about it. Thanks. Um, just in terms of construction, because this is, you know, as you said, this is state of good repair, I mean, partly because it's a conservancy funded project, um, and we can do things much more quickly, you know, when we're using private funding. I mean, the, the fence portion and the stairs, um, we might, weather permitting, actually get started on those this year. But the paving part of it, as it looks at the moment, we're anticipating that, that project will start maybe May and um, run for a couple of months. So, you know, we'll de we hope to be up and running, if not at the beginning of the summer, then during the summer next year. Thank you for that additional information. Um, Gail Lipman will be the last public speaker on this. Thank you. Go ahead, Gail. You just have to click the prompt. Try one more time. Okay. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. You had just answered my question, but my, my question was, when will the pickleball courts be completed? Um, we hope by midsummer. Okay, so sometime in uh, maybe 
July or August. Yes. Great, thank you. Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, I don't see any more questions. Uh, Margaret, I realize you uh, need a resolution for tonight and we don't have a resolution prepared for you, uh, but on the basis of this presentation, uh, I think in general, the committee and the board are very much in favor of this project and everything that you have described. I'm going to go ahead and now take a vote uh, first uh, committee members and then non-committee community board seven members. Um, and then we will be circulating a, um, a resolution to the committee at a later time. So um, parks and environment committee only. Uh, everybody in favor of um, approving uh, the presentation that Margaret just made. Thank you. Please raise your hands. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight hands. Um, okay, uh, all hands lowered. Uh, everybody not in favor, please raise your hands. That's zero. Anyone abstaining? That's zero. Anyone not voting for cause? Also zero. Um, so uh, now for the non-committee members of Community Board 7, I'm going to ask uh, everybody who is in favor, please raise your hands. Fourteen. This is just for community board members. I see there are some hands up in the attendees. I'm just uh, talking about panelists and community board members. Uh, Fourteen. Everybody lowered their hands. No, Tasha, I think it was 13. 13. It actually kept going back and forth. Okay, 13. Um, and then everybody not in favor? Please raise your hand. That's zero. Uh, anyone abstaining? Please raise your hand. And anyone not voting for cause? All right, so the proposed pending resolution passes unanimously 8000-13000. Uh, well done, Margaret. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. And Thank we look forward you. to you coming back uh, next month with um, your other requests for the staircase. The stairs. Right. All right. Th thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Uh, let, me let me apologize. I think I referred to Susan as Sarah earlier. Um, uh, so I'll, I'm sorry about that. But it's okay. It's my Hebrew name. You knew it, Steve. Oh, okay. Very good. Well, it's your first meeting as uh, co-chair. So uh, I got confused. All right. Thank you all. And uh, it's great to see Arena standing again. Uh, take care. Thanks so much, team. Okay, bye. All right. Now, um... Moving right on along um, to item number four. Uh, our next item is the first one of two to be presented jointly with CB7's Transportation Committee. It definitely deserves some context. It is a response to portions of a resolution that Community Board 8 across the park on the Upper East Side passed in September of this year. CB8's resolution refers to Central Park in several instances to fully protected crosstown bike lanes, to the four transverses, and to a two-way protected bikeway around Central Park. Using very unclear and confusing language, CB8's resolution has asked for direct action by the DOT commissioner and the mayor, among many others, to provide major bike infrastructure. So we at Parks and Environment feel compelled to respond to at least part of this uh, CB8 resolution with our position to city agencies and elected officials in the form of our own resolution 
as our district is also adjacent to Central Park. To be clear, there are a few things that we are not going to be doing tonight. Firstly, we are not drafting an unsolicited resolution here. We are simply responding to CB8 September resolution. Very importantly, we are not discussing or resolving on bike infrastructure on city streets outside of our parklands. That will be done at a different time by a different committee. And finally, we are also not here to reopen a couple of past CB7 resolutions related to this topic. Though, of course, they may come up and they probably will come up in discussion. And so with that, I want to invite David Saltonstall from the Central Park Conservancy. Uh, I believe he's here. Um, David, would you like to go ahead and say a few words? I believe you have read the, um, the resolution, uh, CB8's resolution, and I believe also our draft of the resolution. I have, and um, thank you everybody for having me here uh, tonight. We really appreciate the opportunity to weigh in on this um, very important issue. Um, I would say on cross park access, just to cut right to the chase, um, and I'm happy to uh, take some questions. The, the Conservancy absolutely supports the use of roadways, uh, and really the transverse roadways to get from east to west across the park. Uh, we do not believe the paths in Central Park were ever really designed to support this type of, of movement. Um, you know, the whole spirit and design of the park was really to sort of segregate uses and to keep fast moving people away from uh, pedestrians uh, and the footpaths. Um, that said, we fully support the study of cyclists using the transverse roads for travel east and west and are, and are absolutely ready to support our city agency partners on any um, design or, or, or proposal that suggests that. Um, we do think at the end of the day that the transverse roads are the, the logical solution to this. Obviously that will require some design changes to make them safe for bikers who may be trying to get across the park. Um, but that is uh, philosophically it now, uh, our, our fundamental position. Thank you very much, David. Um, um, we, we will get to questions a little bit later, uh, not right now. Right now we're just collecting comments from um, panelists who are here to speak on the topic. Um, I now want to invite um, Detective Inspector Gallagher uh, of the NYPD Central Park Precinct. Um, I know that um, it, the NYPD does not opine on resolutions or anything, but I do think um, you may have something to share in terms of safety in Central Park and the transverses. So D.I. Gallagher, please go ahead. Yeah, good evening, everybody. I'm having a little problem with my camera, so I hope you can hear me as opposed to not seeing me. I uh, just want to begin with the NYPD does not, like you said before, does not take positions on uh, resolutions, and I am explicitly not taking a position on this matter. I just want to lay out a couple of things that particularly in the winter time, um, the transverse becomes most dangerous because it generally ices before the arterial streets. So most of our very, very serious traffic accidents that occur in Central Park occur in the winter time uh, on the transverse. And um, I, I just would also say that whatever decision um, is made on this, I would always advocate that that decision also include a very robust plan uh, to include cameras for traffic safety, for uh, investigations into crimes. And I would just always uh, request respectfully that any planning with respect to that always include uh, those considerations. Um, I thank you all for my time, for your time, and um, it's great to see and, and participate in this process. Thank you very much, D.I. Gallagher. Um, I just wanted to confirm that nobody from the DOT is here. Max or Susan, maybe. That's correct. Um, uh, Colleen uh, was not able to join. Um, she had CB5. Five, I believe it is overlapping tonight. 
Understood. Um, okay, I now want to invite uh, Paul Crickler, who is a colleague from Committee sure. 8 and also the author of CB8's um, resolution that is under discussion right now. Um, very briefly, Mr. Crickler, you may go ahead. Paul should be promoted. Uh, let me double check. Yeah. Hello, can you hear me now? Sorry about that. Okay, my name is Paul Crickler and I'm a member of CB8, but I'm talking in a personal capacity tonight. Uh, what we're looking for and what the resolution for CB8 asked for is uh, protected bike lanes every 10 blocks or so up and down on the east side and the west side from river to park, then park to river. And then importantly, a two-way protected bike lane around the outside of the park on city streets. So nothing in the CB8 resolution is calling for anything to go in the park. And to give you a tiny bit of rationale why we've chosen this route, the first thing is we have a lot of people who want to get between these wonderful places to ride bikes, which is the two rivers and the park, and also tens of thousands of people who commute and need to trans transit because they ride a bike to get to work or get around town. So the first thought was, what about the transverses? As the, the, as the um, person from NYPD spoke about, they're treacherous and horrible. Nobody rides a bike, wants to try and ride a bike in there. I think, at a guess, the only way that would ever work is to make it a bus lane only with bicycles, and that would take forever to get done. So we sort of moved on from that idea. Then the next idea to consider was, what about through Central Park? 72nd Street exists, and it's a lovely place to ride a bike, and it works pretty well. People don't race there because there are pedestrians and it gets on well. There's also mention of 96th Street or 95th Street, and we call that the mythical one because you can never find it. People can't find the start of it. And also it doesn't go all the way to the east side. It's not a real path. So then the idea is what about other places across the park? And the conclusion we came to was Central Park is beloved by so much of New York for what it is. It would take an earthquake to, to make major changes to the park. And maybe we shouldn't even try to do that right now. You know, I love Central Park, the lady who spoke before, I uh, took a tour of the, of the park from the Conservancy as soon as I moved to New York a long time ago. So we thought, let's not try and, and make changes to this beloved institution. There's an urgent need, though, that does need change. People are dying on our streets. People as recently as Carling Mott in the summer of this year on the east side, who was trying to get across the park. We've had Dr. Cameron killed in the transverse, again, trying to get to work across the park. So there is an urgent need to provide safe, passage for tens of thousands of people. That's why we chose to go for the around the park part, not touching the land of Central Park anywhere. There's also an idea that you, I hope people will start to appreciate more and more. A lot of people could ride their bikes more on the streets. We've had lots of testimony elsewhere, but the streets aren't safe enough. So we'd bring out more people to ride in the streets, which again makes it safer for everybody. So I would encourage the uh, board members of CB7 to join CB8 and pass a resolution like this, asking it to DOT to give us every 10 blocks or so up and down the park and around the park. And again, nothing to do with the park itself. Thank you very much, CB7. Thank you very much. Um, I just wish the language in the CB8 resolution was uh, clearer. It's very confusing. Uh, moving on, I, I don't think we have any other panelists um, on this topic, um, but uh, I just wanted to say that because of the nature of this topic, the number of people involved, we've decided to do the Q&A and comment section slightly differently tonight. First, we will take um, questions and clarifications only from committee members of Community Board 7. Um, this is not a time for opinions or comments. That will happen later. Right now, only questions and clarifications from committee members. And um, please state any affiliations that you may have that could lead to a conflict of interest as defined by the Manhattan Borough President's Office that might affect your ability to vote on this matter later tonight. That is your responsibility. Um, and uh, I also want to say that any member who is um, on both committees, I believe we have three of them, um, both transportation and parks and environment will get to speak only once. Um, so first we'll 
do questions from committee members. We will give transportation the courtesy of going first, then parks and environment. And after that, we will take questions and clarifications only from non-committee members. The public will have a chance to speak afterwards, and there will be a discussion by Community Board 7 members afterwards. Right now, we are only asking for questions and clarifications. So uh, with that, I'm going to ask everybody to raise their hand who is um, who wants to ask. Um, all right, so um, Ken Coughlin, go ahead. Hi. Um, I'm a member of both uh, Transportation and Parks and Environment. Um, I have a question for Mr. Saltonstall. Um, hello. Um, <laughs> um, again, um, uh, back in February of 2020, our board unanimously passed a resolution asking the various stakeholder agencies, the Conservancy, DOT, the um, precinct, and the Parks Department to get together and find ways for cyclists to safely and legally cross Central Park. Um, that, that was in February of 2020. We asked for uh, uh, a response by March of 2020. Of course, something else happened in March of 2020. Um, things got a little bit delayed. Um, but I'm wondering if um, you have, have ever met with any of those other three agencies, um, or it sounds like the Conservancy has pretty much made up its mind that cyclists will not be on any um, cross park paths on the surface um, other than the one at 97th Street. Um, is that true? Um, have you thought of uh, possibly dedicating some paths to cyclists or creating uh, separate paths for cyclists in certain areas um, because of the growing demand. Um, and also in our resolution, we asked uh, for uh, better signage uh, for the 97th Street path, um, which um, uh, according to legend, you have to be Ace Ventura pet detective to find. Um, and you have and, to wrap it up. That's and we do appreciate, <laughs> we do appreciate the uh, repaving that you've done there. Um, but if you could answer those questions. Thank you. Uh, I will I will do my best. There's a lot packed in there. Um, as for the 97th Street uh, uh, path, just to get that out of the way, uh, I, I think we are close to having done the repaving that we have planned there. And there are signage um, plans as well that should be completed by mid-December or so. So I think that is ongoing and we hope to bring that to conclusion soon. Um, we have had recent conversations with the Parks Department and the Department of Transportation about tackling this whole question and those conversations are ongoing. Um, at, the, at the moment, they have not included the NYPD, but Deputy Inspector, I'm sure we can find you and, and bring you up to date on those. But for now, this is mostly a, a design question. Um, I don't think it would be totally fair to say that cross park um, uh, uh, routes are completely off the table, but it is absolutely our preference that bikes belong on a safe, redesigned transverse system. Um, the footpaths are narrow, there are benches there, there are other obstructions that at the moment anyways, would make them not particularly safe. 97th Street for a lot of complicated reasons is a little bit of an outlier. Um, finding similar cross park pathways in the park uh, would be very challenging from a design perspective and from a safety perspective, which is always our first concern. Um, but we are having those conversations. They were actually, yeah, as you said, they were, those conversations were quite active in uh, 2018 and 2019, and then everything got shut down. Um, but, um, you know, we are committed to finding what we think is the best and safest solution to this. 
Right now, our preference is for redesigned transverse roads. I, I don't think anybody would disagree that right now they are not safe for bikers, but that does not mean that there isn't a solution that it could, could accommodate all users. And I don't know if I answered all of your questions, but um, let me know. Thank you. Um, about the uh, signage for 97th Street, making it. Yeah, I think that's definitely part of the plan, and that there will you will see uh, more signage out there in the in the near future. Thank you. Um, I do want to remind everybody to keep your questions, um, your language concise and respectful, and also to follow the code of conduct specified in the CB7 bylaws. And I also have to say that tonight we do reserve the right to use the mute button for anyone who is considered to be out of line. Uh, so Jay, go ahead. Thanks, Natasha. Um, yeah, a clarification, a couple of clarifications. I'm not sure who I address this to. I know there have been, uh, prior to the meeting, several iterations uh, of the resolution. And I note that the final uh, resolved clause doesn't reference CB8's uh, resolution. It's just essentially a blanket statement saying, that um, uh, the, that the committee, if, if it passes, doesn't approve uh, these fully the proposal for fully protected bike lanes every uh, every ten blocks and also any protected bike lanes through the transverse. Um, so I, I want a clarification as to whether the failure to approve cross town bike lanes every 10 blocks is that specific to that proposal or is it or should it be the committee's position if, if the proponents of the resolution agree that no cross bike lane, cross town bike lanes uh, through the park or on the transverse uh, should be permitted, whether it's every 10 blocks or every six blocks or every two blocks. Um, is, it, is it the policy and position of the committee that it opposes cross town bike lanes through the park, period? If, if that's the case, why not say so? Susan, you wanna take that? Thanks so much, Natasha. I really appreciate that. <laughs> um, so Jay, um, thanks for that question. I appreciate that. Um, the, the purpose as Natasha laid out for this resolution this evening was that CB8 um, has, has, proposed, has approved a resolution that specifically calls for certain things. And so it's it's our responsibility and our opportunity um, and our right to weigh in on that. So this this has been carefully crafted so that it applies only to what CB8 has proposed. So we we would be out of our purview to bring up other things like you know every two blocks or any blanket statements. This does just address that issue. I hope that makes that clear for you. Somewhat. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Moving on to Howard. Oh, I just have a quick question about the um, the the uh, by the two way bike lane. Would that I just don't understand? Is that proposed to be within the parkland or in the streets outside of the park? In the streets outside. Okay, so it's not in Central Park, in other words. Correct. Okay, I just want to make sure that that's the intent in our resolution as well, because it's supposed to match the our resolution is supposed to be a response to CBA's resolution. So I just wanted to make sure that that's the intent in our resolution. If you could confirm that, Natasha. Yeah, actually I can't confirm that because we are going on the language that we see written in CBA's resolution. And like I said, and many others would agree, the, the language, whoever wrote it, um, is very unclear. It is very confusing to send such language to various agencies, various elected 
officials, that's up to CB8. That's what they chose to do. But we need to make our position clear. And we are not going to align our position with CB8 when it, that's not what this is about. This is a response to CB8, and we are trying to be as clear as possible in our own language. Thank you. So just to confirm, so our language refers to outside and around the park. Our exactly. language is trying, our language is trying to respond to CB8, and we are trying to say that we're not in favor of anything through the park. I, I just want, I'm not sure. I, I just want to. Yeah, to, I, I don't think I can answer your question any more satisfactorily than that, because then we'll just be going round and round. You just have to understand what I just said and take my word for it. But in the park or in the street, I just, could you just answer like that? I said, like I said at the very top, that our resolution tonight has nothing to do with city streets. So that should clarify everything for you. And so that's also written park. in the resolution. So it's in the park. Yeah, it is. I'm not sure what you're trying to say, like with these like little sentences, but you should read the resolution that we circulated today. And you should also try to remember what I said in the preamble, in the introduction. We are not trying to align our position with CB8. We are not trying to match our language with theirs. We are trying to respond to them. Thank you. Moving on to Arena. Thank you, Natasha. And I, I think the conversation you and Howard just had um, is relevant to what was gonna be my question around clarifying what it is the Parks Committee's role is tonight, because we've invited the gentleman from Compute Community Board 8 who drafted the resolution to clarify the intent of the resolution. We now know that the intent of his resolution in fact did not include the park, neither the transverse roads or the cross or the cross paths, walking paths within the park. So if he was invited here to clarify his intent and he's clarified that the intent of his resolution does not involve Central Park whatsoever, then it seems to me that this resolution at this point shouldn't be before the Parks Committee. I know it was discussed at the Transportation Committee because I'm a tra Transportation Committee member. And the reason why we discussed having a joint meeting with Parks is because like you, Natasha, and the Parks Committee, we were under the impression that a Community Boards 8 resolution included the park, but the gentleman here tonight is telling us it doesn't. It only includes cross town streets from Riverside to Central Park West and then protected bike lanes on Central Park West. If that's the intent, and I'm not saying that you should withdraw your committee's resolution, I just want to clarify that this res that this the resolution as it's written, I'm not making a, a case for that either way. I'm just saying that based on the information I'm learning tonight for the first time, this item should actually not be before the parks committee. I could be wrong, but based on what this gentleman shared from community board eight, we're in the wrong committee. Because <laughs> He is, board eight is not taking a position on the transverse roads and board eight is not taking a position on the cross on the cross paths within Central Park. And so I know Natasha, you don't wanna vote in favor of it because it's not clear, but I just wanna say that at this point, I'm not sure the committee should be taking this conversation up. Natasha, can I, can I respond to yes. that? Please do. Thanks so much, Irena, for this. Um, it's it's been very confusing. Um, I, I I certainly concede that. I spent quite a bit of time on this. Um, the issue is that um, that the way the resolution is written, and it has been sent to everybody from Mayor Adams on down to another ten elected officials in city and state level. Um, it does read in a way that it can't be interpreted either way. 
And I have to say, uh, perhaps I could segue into the question I have for Mr. Crickler. Thank you so much for joining us here tonight. Um, I'm looking back at your um, your op-ed piece that you wrote for Streets Blog, August 17th of 2022. Um, you co-wrote with Carl Mahaney, who's also from Transalt. Um, I'm just curious, it says that um, it advocates specifically and very clearly for crosstown bike lanes that go from the, um, let me just get the right wording here, one second. Um, um, just wanna quote this directly. It goes, um, you advocate for crosstown bike lanes through Central Park, quote, from the east to the Hudson Rivers and around Central Park, unquote. So that's very, very clearly um, asking for bike lanes to go directly through Central Park every 10 blocks. So I'm just wondering, has your thinking changed since August 17th? Yes. It has, that's so interesting. Yes. Why would that be? Because it's, it's all the reasons I gave before. We, we came out with a, a new version of this plan, which had a very clear uh, visual image, which I could show it for you, of lots of crosstown bike lanes and then two-way going around the park for the reasons I told you before. But we realized that there's an urgent need to get some safe street infrastructure in place as soon as we can, because in the summertime, someone died. A young lady called Carling Mott was 28 years yeah, old. We've heard about her, sir. Well, <laughs> I want to make sure everyone else hears about it even more. There's urgency to this. And so we figured that it's better to go with something that's a good alternative than wait for perfection for more people to die and be killed by people driving cars. That's the reason we changed our view. Interesting. Well, I would say that, um, that I appreciate that answer, but um, we're still going to, I, I would recommend that we stay, stay here in the Parks and Transportation Committee because frankly, I've heard both versions of this. And in the press recently, as recently as this past week, I've heard this, this resolution referred to as asking for um, explicitly bike lanes through Central Park. So to err on the side of protecting the beloved park, I would say that, Irena, it does rightly belong um, in, in both committees. And particularly since the resolution, which Ms. Natasha rightly said is very confusing, has already been sent to the mayor and to everybody else and their brother. Um, and I will point out again that it was not asking for a study or a proposal, it was asking for immediate implementation. So there's a real risk here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Susan, I appreciate that. Okay, after Arena, we have um, Andrew Albert. Thanks, Natasha. Um, in the and spirit of- Maryland, the sorry. In the spirit of the uh, borough president's conflict of interest uh, presentation, I will disclose I am an MTA board member. Um, what I wanted to do was to ask Mr. Saltonstall, um, are you proposing to enlarge the transverses? Because presently, if two buses are crossing each other, there is no room for anything else except on the sidewalk. And the sidewalk at the moment is pedestrian. So where would you put uh, a protected bike lane other than in? enlarging the transverses, which means changing the walls and things like that. Uh, I just don't understand that. So if you could answer that, I would appreciate it. I mean, we're not proposing anything specifically at this juncture. Uh, we think it would obviously be challenging uh, to provide for protected bike lanes on the transverses, but I also think it's an open question that the DOT could study and that there may be a way to provide room for everybody. There are a handful of pedestrians, or not a handful, there are a very small number of pedestrians who choose to use those pedestrian um, sidewalks on any given day. There are many more bikers who are trying to get across uh, the park. So I think that's worthy of discussion. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I'm not an engineer. I don't have a direct answer for you, uh, but I know that, um, this is a conversation worth having. And I think it's one that I, I, I think, and I don't want to speak for the DOT, but I think the DOT is willing to engage in that process. Oh, Natasha, I'm, I'm sorry. I need to state that I'm a trustee of the Central Park Conservancy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Saltonstall. Natasha, you're on mute. I'm very sorry. Uh, we'll go to uh, Sarah Lind and then Doug Kleiman. And uh, Roberta, I will come back to you later. 
Uh, thanks, Natasha. I also have a question for Mr. Saltonstall. Um, I am a constituent. I am a frequent user of Central Park. I take my kids to the playground there. I, I do picnics there with my kids and my friends. And I also regularly ride bikes through the park. I find it to be the most joyful and wonderful place to ride a bike in this city. I absolutely adore riding my bike through the park, both for fun and for transportation to get to work or other places that I need to go. You made the point just now that very few pedestrians use the transverses. That's because they're basically car gutters. Um, so I guess I'm wondering why the Central Park Conservancy, which is meant to serve all users of the park, has what you describe as basically a discriminatory practice against bikers. You want us to use the transverses while everyone else can use the park. We are also users of the park, and I don't understand and would like to hear from you why you are uh, having a discriminatory policy against bikers in the park. Uh, I think that's strong language, and I'm not really sure what you're getting at. Bikers are. Why are bikers not allowed to go across the park? You said specifically you, Sarah, that heard from bikers you. should Thank be able you, to go across the park. Thank you, Sarah. We heard from you. I think the park was never designed for bikers to be on the footpaths. They're called footpaths for a reason, and they are narrow. There are <clears throat> benches on them. There are other obstructions that, from any engineering perspective, would not necessarily make them safe. I think pedestrians deserve to be heard in this conversation. And I think we're trying to figure out the best solution. I think the transverses offer an opportunity for bikers and that needs to be examined. Um, the whole philosophy of the park and the way it was designed in the first place was to minimize opportunities for different users to, to crash into each other. And I think, um, you know, without a lot of thought, the footpaths would not be a great resolution. Uh, 97th Street, 96th Street um, has worked to a degree, but there are probably very few places in the park where that could be replicated in a way that was safe for everybody. This is a shared space at the end of the day. I think calling it discriminatory is not fair. Thank you. Uh, Doug Kleiman. Yeah, in trying to uh, solve this problem, you know, I, uh, in, a, in a perfect world, and we're not in a perfect world, if anyone didn't check recently, uh, the idea of transverses it just in terms of their uh, their equidistance, and you know, it seems to me that, that that those are the obvious choices. But you know, like Andrea Albert just mentioned, and we've talked about this before, the width um, is just not there at this time. Uh, I'm not a a planner or an architect, but I've always in, in envisioned uh, an elevated type of bike lane. But I I also have studied Olmsted's work and I understand that the transverses were particularly designed to be subterranean so that when looking north to south, it looks like the park goes on forever and they disappear. But I wonder if this is just my thought and take it or leave it, if we come up with some kind of an elevated uh, bike lane going across the transverses that has fenestration and has landscaping where Olmsted's original design is still there uh, and you still can't see it, you know, again, I'm not a pro, but it's just something that uh, came to my mind and I figured I'd, I'd say it rather than uh, say it to myself in the mirror. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. I uh, will now move on to uh, Parks and Environment Committee members. Hold on me. Okay, we were going to come back to non-committee members later, but Roberta, do you have a quick question? Yes, I have two comments. Uh, we're uh, taking questions right now, Roberta. All right. I'm so sorry. <laughs> we have to stick to this procedure because otherwise it'll be just a very long night. Um, but we will come back to you, Roberta. Thank you. Anybody from Parks and Environment who would like to ask a question or get a clarification? Barbara Adler. 
Um, I wanted to suggest something, but if that is not appropriate right now, then I withdraw. Okay, we will come back to a discussion later on after we have heard from the public. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else from Parks and Environment who would like to ask a question or get a clarification? Okay, Roberta, go ahead. Okay. The, the um, car, um, I, I forget what they're called, when you, when you drive through the park, I'm sorry, David, what, what are they called? Transverses. The transverses. Yeah. Thank you. Um, years ago, I actually walked through one of them. And at the end, I had an asthma attack. <laughs> so I can't imagine driving a bike through one without having an asthma attack. Can you address that? Uh, well, I mean, as a regular biker uh, through the park, I do think it's a different thing to be on a bike as opposed to walking. I'm also an asthmatic as it happens, but um, I, I think you're moving at a rate of speed that would just be different than being stuck but, down. But I've done a sidewalk with pedestrians, so I'd have to go pretty slow. Yeah, but it's not the same as walking would, is, is my- I'm my sorry, but my physician would not allow me to walk through the park or drop. <laughs> or ride a bike. But, okay. but I have to say, when I go across the train, if I was riding a bike to the east side and I was in the park, I would walk my bike. So I don't have a problem with walking my bike. I don't understand why bike riders can't walk their bike for the four or five blocks to get from point A to point B. Thank you, Roberta. Um, I don't see any more questions from uh... Anyone else? Um, Jay, we have to move on to the public. Um, I'm sorry, like I said, I'm, I'm only giving people the chance to speak once because otherwise we'll be here the whole night. We will, um, uh, we will have a chance to uh, come back for uh, comments after the public has spoken. Um, so uh, moving on. Uh, we're going to get community input now, and uh, maybe Max, do you want to make some announcements? I do, absolutely. Um, let me just move my screen here. Um, so I do have a couple announcements. Um, we are going to have about 30 minutes of community input right now. And Natasha um, and Susan, uh, we are having uh, two minutes per speaker or a little less? Two minutes? Okay. Um, we're going to have two minutes per speaker. I am going to share my screen when a speaker uh, begins to speak. I'm going to have a timer on there so that way everyone can be aware and then that way no one is usurping anyone else or taking advantage of other people's times and everyone has more or less the exact same two minutes. Um, as I said, the timer will be displayed on the screen. We will be, uh, I would refer to, I would refer everyone to the Q&A section where earlier in the meeting, I used another alias to post some specific instructions for those from the public who would like to speak. And so we would like for anyone from the public to write in the Q&A, whether they are in support or not in support of, uh, of this discussion. So that way um, we can alternate back and forth and get to an equal amount of, of views tonight. Um, I think that is about it. So oh, I see the Q&A is already filling up. So Natasha, feel free to... Jump. Yeah, I also wanted to say if you could um, identify, we are requesting that you identify your affiliation with the district. Do you work here? Uh, do you live here or anything else? Um, and I also wanted to say that members of the public who have already spoken at the Transportation Committee meeting on the 7th of November will be called upon only if there is time left at the end. This is to be more fair. Um, so, um, with that, let me just, um, Natasha, can I ask a question? Who is this? Ken. Ken, um, oh. is this it's, related to the public yes. q and yeah, Yes. Okay. Um, this requirement that people who spoke at transportation can't speak here unless there's time. We were discussing a different resolution of transportation and we were before a different committee. 
So I think they should be given equal uh, time to everybody else. Yeah, thank you for that. But um, no, this is what's being decided because even though the resolution may be different, but the topic is the same. And different board members discussing the CB8 resolution, the response to that. So thank you very much, um, Ken. Um, so I believe the first person would be Jonathan Blank. Sure. Okay. So um, let me move Jonathan over there and it's going to just take a little bit of me toggling back and forth. Jonathan, you should be queued up to speak right now. I'm going to share my screen and share the timer as well. Uh, my name is Jonathan Blank. I, I live I live in community uh, Ward 7. I, I live on 80 West 87th Street. And I'd just like to say that I think bicyclists are given far too much credit in, in the city. They present a menace to pedestrians, especially to old pedestrians. They terrorize us. They have no consideration whatsoever. And I believe the, the transportation benefits are greatly overstated. In, in fact, I, I think most of the bike paths are used principally for uh, delivery of, uh, de delivery of uh, takeout meals rather than really for transportation. And I think that it, the city needs to really give much more consideration to pedestrians who are terrorized and live in fear of, of bicyclists. Thank you. Okay, I believe Giuseppe Tolini. Okay. I see you, Giuseppe. Okay, you should be queued up to talk and I'm gonna share my screen again. Oh, perfect. Uh, thank you all for your time. Uh, I am a resident of uh, CB7. I live on 64th and West End. I just say I want to fully support Paul's resolution. I know that the discussion here has been mainly focused on nitpicking the unclear language on which committee it belongs to. And if that is the case, I would urge you to consider what alternative then we want to propose for making safe bike lanes. Uh, unfortunately, your, the reality is that ridership is up and up because bicycling, if the proper infrastructure is safe for bicyclists and pedestrians, is a excellent mode of transport. I love taking my bike to work. I use it to visit my friends. I use it to do groceries. And I know thousands and thousands of other people do positively use this mode of transit. I urge everyone to, if you've ever thought of any kind of livable city in Europe, in the world, one of the main things that are enjoyable about those cities is that it's friendly to pedestrians and to cyclists. I strongly, strongly, strongly suggest the community to support Paul's motion, Paul's resolution, this is ridiculous that any car can come from New Jersey, cross the bridge and speed down any cross street. West End Avenue is a seven lane arterial road where people are going at 40 miles an hour where children go to school and people exist. This is ridiculous that we don't have safe bike infrastructure. And if we're not supporting Paul's resolution, then we need to come up for one on our own. Uh, I think that's all there is to say. Please, I urge you to support it. That is all. Um, I just want to say there are some people in the Q&A who have written stuff like uh, in support of safe cycling or in support of bike lanes want to speak. Um, it's confusing to me, frankly. Um, so if you want to speak, either you write in support of the resolution or not in support of the resolution. I hope I'm making that clear. The next person to speak is um, Nick Ross. Did Nick Ross already go? Uh, he did not, and I can go ahead, Nick. Let me just reshare my screen. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Nick Ross. I'm a resident of CB8 and I work on the west side in CB7. I'm rising to speak in opposition to the resolution. I'm somewhat disappointed in the tone and tenor of this conversation. 
My girlfriend, Carling Mott, was killed on July 26th of this year. And despite the dismissiveness of the committee, I'm going to say her name again. She was stopped waiting for the light to change, riding lawfully and with traffic when she was hit by a tractor trailer truck as she was biking east to west to get to her office. There's no safe way to get from east from the east side to the west side or even safely into the park with the current bike infrastructure in our neighborhoods. I want to thank Mr. Crickler and CB8 for their work on their resolution. I think they've made it extremely clear what the intention of their resolution was and would hope CB7 should support protected lanes on roads within their jurisdiction in cooperation with those of us on the east side. Much can be said about bicyclists who behave or ride unsafely, but it's frankly irrelevant. Bike lanes, protected ones, help everybody. They give cyclists a safe place to ride and they keep them away from pedestrians, in turn, keeping those pedestrians safe. I would urge you to support safe infrastructure and vote against this resolution. Thank you. Thank you and uh, our condolences, Nick. Um, the next person to speak will be Mendy Haskell. Okay. Oh, I see you, Mendy. Go ahead, Mendy. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm a, my name is Mendy Haskell. I'm a resident of the Upper West Side. Um, I work in Midtown, and uh, part of my commute actually goes through Central Park. I don't think that biking through the park for commuting is any conflict to the use of the park. I've heard this concept of that it wasn't the original intent of the park, that bikes should be there. And that's why they, for years, they opposed even having a bike lane in the, in the loop, in the Central Park loop when the cars were there. Um, I, in the 70s, there was a proposal to put in a bike lane alongside the cars and people opposed it for that reason. That's absolutely ridiculous. Now, when people, bi bicyclists are actually using, crossing the, the, the paths and getting across and uh, every, and because it's not marked and it's not, uh, you know, made to, to go, you, you don't have signage for a route to get across. They end up finding their own ways and they're all over the place on all the paths where they shouldn't be, whether they should be or shouldn't be, they didn't, don't even know where they're going and trying to find their way. Instead of um, you know just trying to punish them by not letting them get through, make it an organized way to get across, and they'll, and they'll all be on one path. And it seems like the park has been you know just ignoring um, the issue and trying to avoid it instead of actually doing something that works rather than chaos. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next person to speak will be Lisa Orman, but I do want to say when I said um, put in the chat or in the Q&A whether you are in support or not in support, we meant in support or not in support of CB7's resolution, not CB8's resolution. This is a CB7 meeting. So go also, ahead, Lisa. Oh, sorry. Oh, oh, sorry, Natasha. I was just going to say something that could make it a little quicker on, on my end, at least. Uh, if you are, if you've already written in the Q&A, continue, continue doing that as Natasha said, but also raise your hand, your virtual hand. I'll be able to find you more quickly and we can kind of move this along. Uh, Lisa, I see you, you're promoted and let's share screen again. Great, thanks so much. Um, just to be clear, I'm completely against this resolution. Um, this resolution starts by saying that CB7 supports the safe transit of all its constituents, whether on foot or bike or in a vehicle throughout the district and within all its parks. And yet somehow by the end, it says exactly the opposite when it opposes protected bike lanes through the park on the transverses or around the park on the city streets outside of its purview. How can this committee even be discussing this? As a constituent, I'm appalled and disgusted by the lack of care and empathy this resolution shows. I would like to invite and ask anyone on this committee to go for a bike ride with me. We'll go around the park, we'll go through the transverses and get a general sense of what it feels like. If you're unwilling to do this, maybe it's because it doesn't feel safe to you. I wanna ask, how would you feel if your parent or grandparent or grandchild rode a bike and wanted to bike through the transverses because it was the only legal way to cross the park? Would you welcome that? If not, then you shouldn't be passing resolutions like this. Public spaces evolve constantly, as Central Park has over the years. In fact, fun fact, the transverses were designed for animals going to slaughterhouses. Let's continue evolving. 
No one asks people to walk their dogs only at 72nd or 96th street and only to look at birds at 96 and 72nd streets. The fact of the matter is that we can all coexist and enjoy the park and get through the park, but it takes some work and a willingness and desire to care for your neighbors. Please vote against this resolution. Thank you. The next one up is Barack Friedman. Followed by Alex Miser. So Alex, uh, if you want to raise your hand. Hey everybody, uh, Barack Friedman. Um, I work at hospitals on the Upper West Side and Upper East Side, and you know we have teams that have to go back and forth between the hospitals. Um, so you know, I do think it would be super helpful to have safe ways, uh, you know, to go across the uh, park. Um, so I urge you to just kind of, you know, I can hear people tensing up because they want to protect Central Park, and Central Park is 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 an art masterpiece, and nobody wants to uh, ruin that. But I urge you just to think about safe transit. Um, you know, like Dr. Cameron just dying, uh, going uh, on the 96 transfers. So I urge you, if you're confused about CB8 resolution and you're not sure if it's what they mean about by around the park, why not just kind of have an addendum saying um, around and not in the park, you know, just kind of take it out of the parks de uh, department and that would kind of clarify it and kind of protect uh, what you're into. Um, and frankly, you know, the Upper West Side is so close to the resolution with the Central Park West Lane, Central Park West bike lane, which was uh, put in because, uh, you know, another death in Madison lie didn't happen there. Um, so I would just urge you, you know, let's be proactive, let's put in the safe cycling in infrastructure ahead of time, rather than after the fact, after somebody dies, uh, it's just not worth it to just wait. So let's do it now. So in summary, one, I'd urge you to just put an addendum to the CB8 resolution to kind of just say, you know, uh, around and not in. Um, and the second thing is, you know, I think people are talking about bikes in Central Park, but if you go south of the reservoir, you know, there's hundreds of cars in Central Park. So I'd ask this committee to say, why is that? Why are there hundreds of cars and nobody's kind of bringing it up? So anyway, thanks for your time. Um, thank you. We are going on to uh, Alex Miser now. Uh, no. Did we just hear? Who did we just hear from? We just he heard from Barack. Barack, sorry. We're going on to Alex Miser right now. It, and no. then Craig later. Oh, I know Craig. All right, here we go. Uh, Alex, go ahead. Oh, try again. Alex, if you're, yep, I think you got it now. Yes. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Great. I don't know if you can see me or not. Um, trying to share all this. Uh, but uh, in any case, um, thanks for everyone for adding context to this. I wanted to add a little bit uh, uh, greater context that I think has been missing from all of this. And that's that I think most of the people here, regardless of your uh, perspective on this issue, I think would probably agree that we need to do something about climate change. And the main driver of climate change is automobiles. Getting any people on bikes anywhere is a huge win for the planet. So it's kind of shocking to me to, to be in New York City and have so many educated people that know this is a real actual issue and we can't even get bike lanes around a park. Why do we even have to debate this issue? The fact that we're, we're debating this at all is kind of like a very bad sign for humanity. So actually, I don't really care. I don't support or not support this resolution because at the end of the day, it doesn't really seem to matter because if we can't even get bike lanes around a park, our species is doomed anyway, doesn't really matter. The resolution can pass or not pass. It doesn't matter at all. Have a good one. The next person to speak is Hindi Schechter or Schechter, followed by Deborah Kersner. Go ahead, Hindi. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. So you ask me, what is my relationship to your district? I'm in your district all the time. 
but my ineradicable relationship to your district is that on August 3rd, 2014, my husband was killed in your district. My husband was killed by an errant 17-year-old cyclist. My husband was a runner. He was also a cyclist. In the wake of my husband's death, I have become an advocate for safe streets. Too late to help me, but hopefully in time to help others. How will we get safe streets? By giving everybody dignified space that they need. Cyclists need protected bike lanes. They need protected bike lanes on the east side. Thank you, Paul Krekla and CB8. They need protected bike lanes on the west side. I spoke for protected bike lanes at CB8 in 2015 and 2016. We didn't get those lanes, unfortunately, until after Colling Mott died. I would like to speak for protected bike lanes here and get protected bike lanes before anybody else dies, please. One person on the committee said, I've heard about that death. You will hear about many deaths if you don't help us to get safer streets with protected bike lanes. Thank you. Excuse me, Natasha, it seems like we're hearing from only people on the um, on one side of the argument. Um, can I suggest that we call on David Barrett next? I think he's on the David other side. Barrett. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, okay, I see you, David. You'll just have to collect the prompt. Try again. And let's try one more time, David, if you're there. Up to the co-chairs, if you want to keep trying or circle back to David. Just give it another sec. Sure. And if we could just ask if there's anybody else um, who could raise their hand if they're on the other I mean, it's I'm not looking to weigh the scales here, but I think that we need to hear from balanced, um, you know, both sides of the argument. So there's anybody else who's, we've gotten a clear picture of the, um, of the pro biking situation. Okay, we will come back to David when David is ready, um, maybe after the next speaker, he will be, how about Deborah Kersner? I see you, Deborah. go ahead. Um, so my name is Nina Kirshner. I am Deborah Kirshner's daughter. I live on the north side of Central Park, and I'm 11 years old. I use Central Park every day to bike to school. I use Central Park on the weekend to bike places like the Central Park Zoo, playgrounds, birthday parties, and ice skating rinks. I've been biking in Central Park since I was five for six years now. I feel safe biking in Central Park because there are no cars, and the only time I need to stop is for people. It's really wide, and they don't have to be worried about being hit by a car. The only cars there are slow and no, I don't go down. Um, transverses are, the, are also very dangerous and I don't bike on them because of that. They also don't connect to the round loop. Um, Central Park is a place for bikers, but it's, and it could be better. If some of the paths are can be designed differently to offer safe place for bikers to connect from the park to the street outside the park without interacting with pedestrians, both sides can have what they want. I'm against any decision that keeps bike lanes like they are today because there's so much room for improvement. Less conflict with people walking, better access to the street, more safety for myself, my younger sisters, and for all children and people overall. Thank you for letting me speak. Bye. Thank you. Is uh, David Barrett uh, available? 
Let's see. David, I just sent you another prompt to unmute. One more time, David. Um, he's not. Uh, okay, let's move on to Andrew Rosenthal. Did I hear somebody? No, don't, let's move on. It's fine. Let's move on to Andrew Rosenthal. Sounds good. Andrew, go ahead. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak. I'd like to bring some facts and figures to this discussion. So I won't name names, even though we should be repeating them every day. In the last 10 years, we've had 40 people killed by traffic violence in our district. That's one every 90 days. So as we sit here and debate over the next 90 days on average, somebody else's loved one is going to die in a traffic accident in our district. There have been 4,472 people seriously injured. That's roughly, or more than, 10 per day. I find this resolution beyond outrageous, and I'm just glad we're on Zoom where I can't show my anger. But this is a more than a step back. This is a leap backwards for everything that community boards around the city have been doing, including CB7, where it did ask for improvements to get cyclists across the park safely. You know, this, this is beyond outrageous. And I ask the committee members to vote against this. One last statistic, which I think is relevant, particularly for David. Central Park has 58 miles of walking paths, according to Google. My estimation is bicyclists have roughly seven miles to bike, which is the loop plus a couple of roads in and out. As I use Central Park almost daily, I have to say that I feel like the, num the amount of space committed to bicyclists is not, inordinate, is not uh, commensurate with the number of cyclists that currently do use the park. And lastly, David, I think your explanations were very disingenuous. Several years ago, we came to Central Park Conservancy with very easy solution which is open up one block or create a roadway from the drive to Fifth Avenue at 97th Street, and you have failed to do that, creating deaths. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, let's go on to uh, Isaac Red. Red I see. Go ahead, Isaac. Hey, how's that? We can hear you. Great. Um, so I'm a, I'm a frequent pedestrian in the park. I don't actually bike uh, too often, uh, but uh, I do feel that uh, the community board needs to support protected bike lanes. Um, and prior speakers uh, ahead of me said it more eloquently than I will, but uh, I would just urge uh, the community board to do more to offer cyclists more protected space, um, just to keep faster moving traffic uh, outside of pedestrian use. So whether that's in the transverses, uh, as was discussed earlier, uh, I would be uh, heavily in favor of that and urge the board to support that. Thank you very much, Isaac. Michael Schwab, followed by Oliver New. Cool. I see you, Michael. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Hi, yes, so I live here on the Upper West Side and I would like to speak against this resolution. I enjoy biking. I like to bike across the West Side to the East Side. I like to bike through the park. And I, when I first moved here, I tried to bike to the East Side across the transverse and it was truly one of the scariest moments of my life biking on that street. And mm -hmm. it is something that I would like to avoid ever having to do again. And I think it would be really helpful and really important and would save lives to have more paths for bikers across the park that did not involve the transverse and that were protected and offered safe and easy access. And I think that's something that this community board should be working towards. Thank you. Um, Oliver New and um, then coming back to David Barrett. Hello. 
Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Hi, I'm Oliver New. I live uh, five blocks above this district, so I bike through here all the time. And I think there's generally been lots of unneeded criticism of the CB8 resolution when the author is here and very clear about his intent. And nobody reasonable is proposing bulldozing inside of Central Park a two-way bike lane, unlike how cars were originally led into Central Park. If the authors of this resolution want only the text of the resolution to matter, this resolution, in my opinion, is equally unclear. This resolution says, quote, CB7 does not approve, and then in the same sentence, quote, the addition of a two-way protected bikeway around Central Park. Is this against the bike lane inside the park or outside the park? If you, like, want to nitpick, we can nitpick, you know, all day until the cows come home. You know, it's not going to get us anywhere. The resolution from CB8, in my opinion, is, is very, very simple. It asks DOT to bring a plan back to CB8 that asks for bike lanes every 10 block or so, so that people stop dying, not for DOT to go in and do whatever they want to Central Park. This community board should be a leader, save lives and do the same thing. Otherwise, I think the members of this community, especially if you vote for this resolution, should be ready for the public comments to continue to be as unbalanced as they have because nobody supports this outrageous nitpick resolution. All right, and the last person to speak will be Carl Mahaney. Go ahead, Carl. Thanks, can you hear me? Yes. Great, um, thank you. My name is Carl Mahaney. I, um, my relationship to the district is I ride through the district every day with my son, he's seven. Uh, my wife rides through the district every day to her job downtown. Um, uh, I wanna just tell Ms. Schwartz real quick that I am the Carl Mahaney who wrote that, co-wrote that op-ed with Paul Crickler. Um, I'm happy to share it with the committee. It's very well written. Um, and it does not call for moving through the park at all. That's because I work on these issues every day as an advocate. Um, I do not work for TA. I work, I direct Streetopia Upper West Side. We um, advocate for livable streets on the Upper West Side because we believe that human beings matter, not cars. Um, and I know how complex the issues of the park are. In fact, I've been analyzing with Beta NYC city bike data to try to understand just how many people are moving through the park each day on a bicycle. And our preliminary analysis suggests that up to 5,000 people just on city bikes move through the park each day. If you sort of extrapolate from uh, ridership data, annual ridership data from city bike and DOT, that means over 10,000 people are moving through the park every day. So those 42 million visitors that, that visits that Central Park gets each year, millions of those are tr trips by New Yorkers on bikes who use the park to get as a, as a car-free greenway to get where they're going. Um, it's a failure of imagination to think that there's not a way to accommodate that number of people in the park. And I wanna say one more thing. I mentioned this to my son, again, who's seven, and this is a literal response uh, when I read him the resolution. That's so rude. Make sure people don't literally do that. If that happens, people are gonna yell at us more and we're not going to listen to them. Are we, Papa? No, we're not. We're gonna keep riding through the park and hopefully, people will find a way to make to accommodate us. Thank you. Thank you very much. That brings to an end our um, public testimony. And uh, just for the record, we heard from everyone who signed up. There was nobody that we did not hear from. Um, Natasha, can I add something here? Who is this? This is David Salton. Oh, yes. Go ahead, please. Um, I appreciate everybody's comments. I, I do feel it's necessary to just point out where the jurisdictional lines are here. Um, I, I think some people are under the impression that the Central Park Conservancy controls the roads through the park, controls the roads around the park. Um, we do none of that. We maintain the park. The Department of Transportation makes all policy decisions around roads around the park, and the Department of Parks controls the footpaths within the park. So we are here as advocates for safety for everybody. Uh, and I do think that there is a resolution somewhere in all of this that can achieve that. But please don't confuse us as people who own and operate and control what happens in the park. We are the maintainers of the park, the stewards of the park, and you know we have views on what would be best, but 
um, we are in no way the decision makers in all of this conversation. Thank you very much, David. Um, before we move the discussion back to the community board, I do want to extend our condolences to Nick Ross and also Hindi Schachter for their loss. Um, so coming back, um, we now have uh, we now bring the conversation back to Community Board Seven. Um, at this point, we are taking comments and discussion, uh, but I think a lot has been said. And um, it's eight fifty. <laughs> we still have one more item on the agenda. So I would ask everybody to keep their comments concise and also to remember once again what the resolution is about. This is not about, I mean, ultimately it is about safety, but we are at the end of the day, we are responding to CB8's resolution. We are not trying to develop something brand new. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Um, and so I will start again the same way that we started before. We will go to committee members, first transportation, then parks and environment, and then to non-committee members. Um, and um, uh, once again, please state your affiliations, any conflicts of interest as defined by the borough president's office. So I will start with Ken Coughlin, Arena, and then Sarah Lind. Okay. Um, I, Arena is right. Anything on the streets is not in this committee's jurisdiction. Um, I understand that Susan thinks there's a risk that CB8's resolution could be misunderstood. I don't understand that. To me, CB8's resolution was crystal clear. Um, and we have heard from the author of that resolution, and that confirms my understanding of it when I read it. It has nothing to do with Central Park. Um, Susan is concerned that there's a risk that somebody will misunderstand it and create a, a protected bike lane across Central Park. We've just heard from a representative of the, of the Conservancy who's, who is extremely wary he made it very clear of putting any cross park surface paths for cyclists across the park. Um, he said bikers are never supposed to be on footpaths. Um, so there is no risk here. Th this, it just seems that what we're doing here is an empty exercise with this resolution. Um, and it also seems that what we're doing is what the resolution does is offer a verdict while the jury is still out because as David Saltonstall said, the agencies are still in discussions about what to do um, with getting cyclists across the park. Uh, the Conservancy favors the transverses. Um, uh, we don't know what other stakeholders favor, but uh, this resolution has already reached a conclusion, which is we will not expand any more uh, cross park any way for cyclists to get across the park other than what we have, which is one legal and safe route all the way across the park. Um, it uh, it just it's just it's it strikes me that uh, the irony that we're going to be discussing a city council bill next was generated in part out of a concern for the safety of horses on our streets. And yet when it, when it comes to people who ride bikes, safety seems to be not a concern at all. Ken, I have to stop you there now. Ken, no, I have to I have stop not you. Finished. I have, not I have finished. to move on to I Arena. Have bit, Thank I have a little you. bit more. It's been more than two minutes and you had a I, chance to I have about two more well. sentences, Thank Natasha. You. Nata okay, I'm gonna continue. Shall I continue? I would like you to not continue. I would like to move on to other people I on board two. who would like to speak. Uh, Thank you. Natasha, I've been on this committee for 13 years. <laughs> Thank you, Natasha. Um, just two points I'd like to make. The first is that I, I really took issue with Sarah Lynn's comment uh, where she accused the conservancy of cons discriminatory practices. I think it was I think it was a bad form and it was inappropriate and not factual. I worked for the Conservancy for 12 years. And in that time, we partnered with Transportation Alternative 
to close the park to vehicles to accommodate cyclists. The conservancy was at the forefront of that action. And for her to accuse them of discriminating against cyclists is, is just ridiculous. I cannot get past it, I'm sorry. I wanna also say that I have watched, although I was in support of closing the park to cars to accommodate cyclists, here we are three decades later and you can't cross the drive. If you are a park person who supports climate change and wants to walk to work, wants to walk through the park, you literally put your life in danger because cyclists will not stop for you on the drives, whether there's a red light, green light, yellow light, they won't stop. Putting bikes on footpaths is the most dangerous thing we could do at this juncture. Given the fact that that's the only safe place pedestrians have. So I just don't, und I've listened to all these comments, the way that they are accusing board members of being insensitive to cyclists, even though Community Board 7 <clears throat> and the Conservancy supported closing the park to cars to accommodate cyclists. And to now say that we're discriminating and insensitive and not supporting climate change is just, it's just ridiculous. I can't, I don't even understand how people could just wrap their brains around some of the comments we've heard tonight. We support cyclists, but we need space for pedestrians to walk that is safe and not in conflict with cyclists because they've taken over so many parts of the street and the park. As one person said earlier, the elderly can't cross the street today because of the cyclists that don't stop for the lights. I just I'm thank you very sorry. much, Irina. We have thank to you, move on. Natasha. Thank you, Sarah. And after Sarah, we will have uh, Jay Adolf. Thank you. Uh, well, like I said in my previous remarks, I am a frequent user of the park. Not every day, but almost. Um, I do walk through the park all the time, much more than I bike through the park. Uh, I cross the transverse. I mean, I cross the uh, loop road all the time and I see every other user crossing the loop road. So it certainly is possible to cross the loop road. And obviously if we look at the data, hardly anyone ever gets hit by a bike. So, you know, I, I think we should think about the data here. We see people crossing the loop road safely all the time, never getting hit. It might feel scary sometimes, but of course I'm terrified every time I cross the road because cars run red lights all the time, especially around school drop-off time. That's another issue. Um, I also think it's disingenuous to say that we're not proposing something new. The resolution explicitly states uh, that CB7 does not approve of bike lanes through Central Park. So that is a new thing. We are saying something here. We're not only responding to CB8's resolution, so we can't pretend like this is only in response. That is a direct positive statement, and we need to vote on this at, on that. That's what we're voting on. So you can't pretend like this is just clarifying CB8's resolution. Uh, again, again, Carl mentioned this, but the city bike and DOT data show that tens of thousands of people ride their bike through, across, and around the park every day. And that number is only growing. We've seen the bike boom uh, expanding almost every month. Um, uh, and if this committee passes this resolution, you're essentially saying that you don't care about these people's lives, which is pretty shocking. Um, and also totally out of step with every other community board around the park who wants to add protected paths for bikes. The reality is that people are going to continue to bike through the park, whether we provide Sarah, them with good paths or not. Thank you. And if we want to accommodate all these people, we need paths that work for them. As Hindi said, someone who has tragic experience of us not having separated paths for bikes and pedestrians, if you are a pedestrian in the park and you don't want to get hit by a bike, you should want us to have separated and clear paths directed for bicyclists and pedestrians. Thank That's you, Sarah. going to help us We're separate going to move on to Jay Adolf. Safe. Thank you very much. Jay. Yeah, thanks, Natasha. First of all, just an observation. Twice you asked that when people speak, they disclose their affiliation uh, if it impacts this particular issue. And so far, uh, none of my colleagues have done so. I noticed that. Um, I'm going to, you know, this, this resolution and the... Um, what we call precatory language in in, uh, in legislation, which is language that doesn't really 
affect what's being enacted or resolved. And there's so much of that here. And there's so much uh, overlaying uh, the discussion here. So I'm going to make it simple for myself, which is I'm going to look at actually what the resolution says, not what somebody might imply that it says or bring their viewpoints to what it says, but what it says. Uh, with respect to my colleague, Sarah, it does not say that this committee opposes bike lanes across Central Park. What it says is that this committee does not approve bike lanes every 10 blocks across town and across Central Park. It doesn't say we might not approve two protected bike lanes across Central Park or five or none. It says we will not approve 10 protected bike lanes across the park or protected bike lanes on the transverse. So in my opinion, that's what I'd be voting on. I agree with the resolution and I suggest that we don't have to read anything into it that isn't there. With all the, the pre-resolved references to CB8 and all the discussion about safety and so forth, Let's vote on what the resolution says. Thank you very much. That is cross town bike lanes across Central Park every 10 Thank you. blocks. We have to move on to Howard and then Andrew and then Alex Bell. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to address some of the language used tonight. Some people are calling this pro bike. Some people are calling this anti bike. I want to address this from the pedestrian perspective, actually. I live on Central Park West. I walk my dog there multiple times a day. And there is a problem. It is, there is a safety issue. And by having protected, isolated, clear, delineated areas for the bikes and for the pedestrians would only improve safety for the pedestrians. I want to make that clear. I don't think they belong on the, on the ped pedestrian paths. I actually think, I am not an engineer. I've said a million times in my own committee, the Transportation Committee, we pay high taxes so there are experts who can figure this out. I don't know the best way to get bikes across the park from east to west, but I do know the current chaotic situation doesn't work. It doesn't work for bikers and it doesn't work for pedestrians. And I would like the city to figure it out. Again, I don't know the answer. I would like them to figure it out. I actually think the transverses might be one way and this resolution specifically says the transverses are off the table. I think that's a great place to look because they're underutilized. So I think that would be a great start to look there. Again, I don't have the answer, but what I do know is there is a lack of safety and this will only make it worse. This community board has unanimously called on the city to figure out a safe way that the park can be used by pedestrians and bikers. And I think we should stick to that and not adopt this resolution. Thank you very much. We go on to uh, Andrew and then Alex Bell. Thank you, Natasha. Um, so listening to this discussion tonight, I think one thing is, is missing from this resolution. Um, I understand where the resolution is coming from, but after hearing Mr. Saltonstall and others, I think we should be calling on the, depart the Parks Department and the Department of Transportation to come up with a plan for cross park bike routes. And I think we should ask them to, we should give them a time limit, you know, please get back to us by whatever, March uh, <laughs> or, or April. I, um, I, I think we need to hear from them what is possible and what is not possible. And I think that's really what's missing. I think we can say we don't want something every 10 blocks, but we'd like to hear a proposal for safe through park bike access. Um, and, and I think that's really important. And I think it's missing. Thank you. Alex? Uh, yes. Hi, everyone. I'll be voting against the resolution. I agree with Arana's point that she made in the beginning. I read the CB8 uh, um, resolution, and it's clear to me that this is not about bikes in through Central Park, so I'll be voting against. Andrew Reggie. Thank you. 
Yeah, I just, you know, I, I'm a big believer in the tone. And when I read this resolution, the tone is essentially, we don't want this. We don't want this. We don't like the way CB8 went about that. But I think listening to all the comments, what people tend to agree on is we want people to be safe, whether they are pedestrians, whether they are on bikes, or however they are getting through the park. And I deal with this all the time. And people feel unsafe, whether they're on a bike, or whether they're walking or on a scooter or however else they're getting around. So I would just suggest if we don't like exactly what CB8 is saying in their resolution, instead of saying we don't like ABC of their resolution and kind of gives the impression that we're shooting it down, let's not talk about what we don't like. Let's talk about what it is we want. So perhaps it is talking about how can we change this resolution to get what we want to see to make sure that everyone getting from one side of the park to the other side of the park or one river to the other river can do it safely. I feel like all this unnecessary conflict and back and forth is completely unnecessary because we're just talking about like words and how we get there. But at the end of the day, whether you're walking from one side to the other or you're on a bike, you wanna do it safely. So like that should be the focus of a resolution, not just discrediting other people because then we just set up a situation where I'm on this side and you're on this side and you've heard my spiel before. There's way too much of that. So that's it. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Um, I don't uh, believe there's anybody else from uh, transportation. Anybody from parks and environment? Um, I will ask. Um, if you're not from parks and environment, if you're from transportation and you've already spoken, if you could please lower your hand. Um, Elizabeth Caputo, please go ahead. Yeah, I don't think I've spoken at all tonight during the meeting and I'm a member of both committees uh, and I look forward to discussing the next item on the agenda, which I have opinions about and it's already 9.07 um, this evening. Uh, look, I do think we need to think about ways to provide safe access across the park for everyone, uh, including cyclists. I'm not sure this resolution does that, um, the resolution that's been proposed. And again, as a member of both the committees, um, I agree with what Arena said. And uh, I think we should really consider how we're going to do it safely and responsibly. And I thought Dave Stall also offered very good um, comments tonight and uh, hope people will take that in mind based on his expertise as somebody who has worked in city government for a long time and also knows the park. Thanks. Uh, Mark Diller. Thank you. Um, I want to pick up on the thread that I understood Andrew Riggi to have uh, offered or started with, which has to do with tone. Um, and, and I'm going to confess that the tension in this room um, is giving me pause. I've agreed to be the next co-chair of transportation because of Howard's term limit, and now I'm wondering what the devil I'm, I was thinking. Um, the tone of the resolution, even if you parse it as carefully as you has has been presented here tonight, it, is a punishing one, and it, and it, and it concerns me greatly that it does so. Um, the recitation of rules in the body of the resolution that are of course the subject of reconsideration but presenting them as rules in the resolution is part of that tone and that's the concern and also the way in which the declarative or therefore clause is written strikes me as making the exception the rule and the rule the exception um, and so it, that concerns me greatly but the real reason that I can't support this resolution with apologies to those who worked so hard on it and I acknowledge the work is that in my view, it revisits and compromises and interferes with a prior resolution. And once our board has spoken, unless the world has changed, I am loath to revote and reconsider. And so this interferes with the resolution. I think it's the one that Ken mentioned but it's also the one that the transportation committee 
has raised any number of times uh, with our colleagues at the Department of Transportation, calling for, I think back then we used the word task force, and trying to find a solution which will admittedly be imperfect. It probably will be involved rewriting something or rebuilding something um, because really smart people, including those in this room, have come to the conclusion that there's no easy answer to this problem. And so we're only going to be working on not easy answers. And that's where I think this resolution takes us away from that process. Um, so I don't think this resolution and its language expresses the intent that was offered to us as the purpose for the, the, the vote that we're being asked to take. I wanna pause one more second and say that I share the frustration of those who have spoken tonight about the ways in which cyclists sometimes are seen on our streets and I'm sorry to say on our sidewalks. Um, but I am chastened by that because I've been reminded that cyclists are no more uniform a group than lawyers, that's me, um, <clears throat> or preservationists or anybody else. And I'm concerned that the legitimate concern for uh, the folks that I actually walk down the street and yell at to get off of the sidewalk near a public school park does not, should not interfere with what I understood um, uh, Ms. Uh, the, 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 the woman, Hindi, Hindi, is that it? Who said that something that we need to find dignified protected space for everyone. I think that's the work of the transportation committee as I foresee my role on that and I view this resolution as being antithetical to that work. So I would encourage my colleagues to eschew all of the hyperbole, stick to the language of the resolution and please vote against. Thank you. Um, Elizabeth, your hand is up. Are you, do you still wanna talk or? No, not at all. I just, I would really like us to think about how we're going to handle the next item on the agenda. Um, Thank which you. I okay. Think I have to. Warrants, warrants a lot of conversation tonight sure. and may be worth tabling. Uh, how about, um, I saw Barbara Adler. I will be very brief. Um, to Mark, I would just like to say that things change. A resolution that was passed two and a half years ago when bikes were not as plentiful in the park and now are two very different things. I see no reason why we cannot uh, have a new resolution that supersedes the old one. Um, to Arena, I would like to say, I agree with you a thousand percent. I, am, I use the park almost daily. I am a pedestrian in the park. I don't ride my bike anymore. And um, I have gotten nearly killed too many times. And, and that includes being on paths where bikes shouldn't be. The park is loaded with e-vehicles and they shouldn't be there either. And delivery people, if there were license plates for bikes and for others, it would be a whole different world. But I think that David's solution is probably the best one. I don't know how it would be done. But I think um, that the transverses, if they could somehow be expanded or whatever, would, is the way to go. Thank you. And, and I am in favor of the resolution. Um, uh, I'll go on to uh, Beverly first. And then Susan Schwartz. Um, hello, um, I, um, this has been a very um, informative and useful conversation. Um, I think uh, learning the intent of uh, Community Board 8's resolution has been helpful to me in terms of understanding. I think we're going a little far afield. I think everyone on this call cares deeply about safety uh, of both pedestrians and uh, bicyclists. Um, I'm not sure our resolution, having understood that, um, uh, is the best vehicle for expressing that common view. And I would uh, agree that having uh, a slightly more positive 
tone to something would be helpful. So um, at this point, um, I turn it back to you, Natasha, to figure out what we should do next. Go ahead, Susan. Um, thanks so much. Um, thank you, everyone, for your comments. Um, I, it's been very educational. I, I do want to make a couple clarification points. Um, but first, I should spill the um, cut the suspense and say that I do think that we perhaps should take this back and rewrite it and rework on it um, rather than voting on it tonight, if that's OK with everyone. But first, I'd like to just say that um, the term crosstown bike lanes can be so confusing um, as we've worked very hard on this. Thank you, Mark, for acknowledging that. Um, we've tried to be very collegial and productive and work um, with across both committees. And I do appreciate the work and time has gone into this. Um, if anybody doubts that, I will tell you that um, for my own case, you all know I'm a bird watcher. I have not seen either the osprey that's been in the park the last week, and I have not seen the eastern bluebird that's been in the park this past week. Anybody who follows my Twitter account knows that, in fact, I have not seen either of these great birds. Um, but this, this crosstown bike lanes um, issue can be very confusing. In September 2020, our board passed a resolution that was titled Crosstown Bike Lanes on 72nd Street, and it asked DOT to present a proposal for physically protected two-way bike lanes on West 72nd Street between Central Park West and Riverside Drive. We didn't ask for crosstown bike lanes all the way across the park. I want to just stress that we did not ask for them all the way across the park, but yet in the preparation for this resolution, several times people have referenced that resolution and said, we've already approved cross town bike lanes that go through the park. So I just want to say, we really all need to be very, very clear and very careful about what we're, what we say when we say cross town bike lanes. Um, I'm going to take Mr. Crickler and Mr. Uh, Mahaney at their word that they didn't intend their resolution to ask for bike lanes through Central Park, but it was very confusing, and um, I think there's a real problem there because that letter has already gone to Mayor Adams and then everyone on down. And perhaps in the interest of good faith, perhaps you would be willing to send a letter clarifying that, that in fact, you were not asking for bike lanes through Central Park every 10 blocks. That would be really helpful and collegial if you were to do that. Um, so finally, I just wanna say um, thank you for all your time. And um, I think we will definitely have to take another look at this. I do wanna point out that there are plenty of places in the Central Park for bikers to ride. They've got the North and South loops, the cars are gone. So um, a cyclist could come into the park at 72nd Street and take the North and the South loop and then get out at 72nd Street. And it'd be a lovely ride. Um, while you're doing that, I would recommend that you stop at the red lights for the pedestrians because it can be pretty perilous. That's all I have to say, thanks so much. Thank you. I see two other hands up, but I'm assuming they're old hands because um, we've now decided to come back with this issue some other time. Um, I'm going to move on now to item number five on our um, on our agenda, and I think Susan, you will take that. Well, I think Natasha has already done uh, the yeoman's work here, so at least I can just introduce just one item. Um, so this is about. Um, proposed legislation that's pending in city council, which was brought up in the, um, I think in the transportation committee a while ago, a couple months ago, Elizabeth Caputo brought it to everyone's attention. Um, uh, they proposed, as everyone's seen this, they proposed to wind down the horses in Central Park and then to replace them with electric vehicles. And so um, what we're doing here is the same thing we were trying to do with the last resolution. I hope we did a little bit better here. Um, what we've done is, simply take a position on this and let city council know how CB7 feels on it. So without further ado, um, want to take it away, Natasha? Call on some people. Yeah, so the same process as before. We would like to go to uh, transportation committee members. Um, if you could raise your hand, um, anybody with any questions first. Anybody with any questions at all? I don't see any hands up. How about, um, oh, uh, Mark, I will come back to you. How about um, uh, the Parks and Environment Committee? Uh, can I just clarify, Mark, the reason we're coming back to you is not because we don't like you, but because you're not on either committee, so it's committee members first. Uh, Elizabeth, you said you wanted, you had something to say. 
And after Elizabeth, sure. no, I, look, look, I think the only thing is it's, it's late tonight. And uh, I don't know if there's anyone from the community who wants to weigh in tonight, but I think that's an important thing before we take a vote on this. My understanding is that the the uh, legislation coming before the city council will probably not get a vote until next year. Uh, I think, it, you know, it's 919 at night. Uh, it's an important issue. I think there are issues related to two things. Um, one is obviously the issue of the electric uh, carriages, uh, which is part of the legislation if you all read it. The other is the issue of what to do with the horses and and how to humanely uh, work with all parties to figure out uh, what's happening with them, what's going to happen with them, what is going to happen if this legislation goes through. And so that is the reason that we started talking about this. The legislation was proposed in July. Uh, we've obviously had other things on our mutual committees that we've been dealing with. Uh, again, I am I am open to uh, folks discussing whether we discuss this tonight or table it to a time where we can all be, um, you know, more uh, more in a state where we have. Uh, people from the Parks Department, I don't know if Dave Saltonstall is still on the call, uh, other people from parks, veterinarians, other um, objective people who can actually weigh in on this issue. Um, to me, that would be really important before I place a vote. Um, but I do think it is an important issue that's going to become, become a part of what, um, you know, our district in CB7 is doing on the west side. And, uh, you know, we've talked about it on both committees. I'm a member of both committees and just want to make sure that we um, give it its proper due as a community board. And I think there's an opportunity for us uh, to both weigh in on it, um, uh, maybe not tonight, but to perhaps do a public meeting in the next month or two where we can actually have some of the objective parties come in and give us the facts and the data um, so we can make an informed decision before we vote. That's all, thank you. Uh, I'm going to go to Doug Kleiman and then Andrew Albert. Um, I, I tend to agree with what Elizabeth just said, given the, the time and the lack of other people that may wanna weigh in. Although I do note that in the Q and A, there's someone here and since this meeting was noticed, oh, there she is, she, now she's- Yeah, I, I'm sorry, oh. Doug, you can continue your thought and then we'll go to Christina. Okay, great. So I the, just the one thing, and, and perhaps we'll opine later, is what I don't like about this bill is that it is in inextricably intertwined, uh, where if you if, if this bill is voted in the affirmative, then it is getting rid of or phasing out the horses and replacing with electric. Well, I don't think those two things have to be mutually exclusive. So I, I don't like the way the bill is written at City Council, and I wish that they would break those two issues together, or, or apart, I should say. One is phasing out the horses, that's one issue, yes or no. And do we want it to replace those with the electric vehicles? Yes or no? Uh, because I'm, you know, so anyway, that, that's it and, uh, and thank you. Uh, I'm going to go to Christina Hansen now and then Andrew Albert. Hi guys, uh, thanks for having me on tonight um, and discussing this issue. I am a New York City carriage driver. You've probably seen me in the park, I am the chief shop steward for TW Local 100 Central Park Horse Carriages. We are represented by Transport Workers Union Local 100. Um, and uh, so just, I mean, I've, I've enjoyed listening to the conversation tonight about the bicycle issue. Um, you know, we spend all our time on the park drives. And uh, so, you know, we see a lot of that stuff going on. Now, with regards to this bill, um, this bill was introduced in July by Bob Holden, and it is essentially, you know, it's intro 573, which ironically is the same number of the same bill that was introduced in 2014 by council members Danny Drum and Adonis Rodriguez. The only difference there being is that they wanted to replace the horses with green cabs. Originally, this whole anti-carriage movement in New York City that has been going on since before Bill de Blasio was elected mayor, separate from the radical animal rights PETA movement, has been put forth by a couple of organizations, NICLAS, and now a successor organization, Voters for Animal Rights, um, which is was founded by the former director of, of, of NICLAS. 
Um, and that the whole idea was to replace our horses with machines. Um, they originally had proposed an electric car that just could not be built. It had it featured a 2000 pound battery. It was shown at the car show uh, in 2014. Everybody hated it. Um, and so intro 573, the original one in 2014 would have proposed um, replacing the carriages with um, the horses with green taxis. So that, of course, would remove us from the park entirely. We didn't want to do that. We're not taxi drivers. We're horse people. Um, this bill from Bob Holden uh, is basically the same thing with instead of an electric jalopy, you've got an electric golf cart that's looked like a carriage. It's the same thing. Um, only this vehicle would travel 25 miles an hour um, and would be able to travel in uh, New York City regular traffic. They are proposing putting stands not just in Central Park, but um, in um, Rockefeller Center, the theater district. Uh, in 2014, Charles Kamenoff actually did the math to see what would happen to congestion in Midtown by simply adding you know, additional 68 vehicles circulating kind of aimlessly through Midtown. And it's significant. Um, you know, so that whole story has already been discussed by the previous city councils that's been looked at. Um, so, you know, in terms of a resolution about does, do, do people want electric vehicles in Central Park after, um, you know, we got cars out of the park. I, 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 I would think that based on what everybody has said here tonight, that the answer is probably no. Um, you know, we already have electric vehicles in the park. They're called pedicabs with illegal motors. Um, and there's hundreds of them. And so I don't think we need big giant electric car golf cart carriage things that don't exist, wouldn't be built, would be bought by the city and leased to the existing carriage owners. Uh, so obviously we as workers, I'm a carriage driver. I don't own a carriage. I don't want to drive an electric carriage. I you know, want to be with horses. Um, the carriage owners, they're horse people. They want don't want to go from being small business owners who have horses to becoming lessers from the city. Uh, Christina, I'm sorry. Can we ask you to try to um, race toward the end here? We're really. OK, so anyway, so there's two issues here. And one of the other uh, board members basically said and that's about the horses. So TWU, um, we joined them a couple of years ago, and we have a whole list of things that we would like this new administration, who is no longer trying to kill the horses, um, no longer unfriendly like the de Blasio administration was, uh, we call it our heart platform, you know, things to look at improving the carriage industry more than the regulations we already have. And so, you know, there's two separate issues here. There's the electric car proposal and there is the horse issue. And I don't think we have the time tonight to get into how well our horses are treated, what kinds of things does TWU Excuse want me. in the water I'm truck. Sorry. I'm sorry, I really have to ask you to try to wrap it up. Um, thank you. So anyway, that, those are the two issues. So anyway, I'm here for questions. Thanks so much. Uh, Ken? Thanks. Um, I'd like to ask Christina a couple of questions, if I could. You know, um, Ken, really, um, we've we're, we've really gone beyond the time for Christina to speak. Oh, and she's really it's. Um, well, I get then. I guess the question is, or do we want to vote on this tonight, or do we want to put it off? No, I um, want to vote on this tonight. What, you what want to vote on it tonight? Okay. Um, well, okay. I'm just going to say a few things. Um, the uh, ab about the what. Horses, pulling carriages in Central Park are second and third careers for many horses. Um, if it wasn't for this option of coming to New York City and doing this relatively light duty compared to farm work, these horses would be going to the slaughterhouse. Um, so if we get rid of horse carriages, any future horses uh, who might go into that pipeline and come to New York City after doing farm work in like Pennsylvania, would would be condemned to death. So, you know, if, if we you really care about the horses, anybody who really cares about the horses needs to think seriously about the consequences of ending the horse carriage pr program because that it's basically to the slaughterhouse for many, many hundreds of horses. Um, and, uh, and also not, something that also hasn't been brought up is 
what a lot of people say is really behind this, which is where the stables are located. The stables are located on extremely valuable land in Midtown that developers would dearly love to get a hold of. Um, and uh, there was a, um, uh, there were um, headlines in Gothamist, Gothamist called NICLASS, the developer backed, um, uh, you know, organization uh, trying to get car, uh, carriages out of the park. Um, you know, there was another article in 2014 from Gothamist about how the developers are just uh, drooling over, over these stables. So there are a lot of people who think that's really what's behind this and that the animal rights people have been sort of become the willing dupes of, of the developers. Um, Thanks so much, Ken. Can I, uh, can I sort of short circuit this, Natasha, give me a little bit of leeway here. Um, I'd like everybody to look at their clock, their watches and see that it, the time is now 9.30 p.m. on Monday, September 21st, 2022, and you're going to watch history being made. Ken Coughlin and I are on the same side of an issue. I'll repeat that for emphasis. Ken and I completely agree on this. So I think we should just dispense with all the rest of the conversation and we should just vote on this right now while we have this moment, <laughs> this rare moment. I hope somebody from the West Susan, I'm called on by Natasha next. Um, I have a very quick question. It better be quick, Andrew. It's really quick. And I quick. have a quick comment. Yes, yes, Arena. Go ahead, Andrew. Um, has, has the Parks Committee attempted to get the sponsors of the legislation to speak before the committee? 100% agree with what Andrew's saying. Um, this was originally on the docket for the Transportation Committee. I'm going to uh, toss it back to you, Andrew, and ask. Um, I, I believe we asked if they had been asked about it. I don't know the answer to that. We did not because we assumed since it was on your agenda for November 7th that you would have already asked them that. Okay, uh, we did. But it I may have, be something that makes sense. I have a quick comment. Yes. We have one of those people on the phone right now, which is David Salson Saul. I, I, I have a quick comment, which is on along the same lines as Susan's comment that Ken and I don't often agree, but I agree entirely with Ken's last comment. Yes. Thank you. Um, can I just say that um, what, what we're doing tonight is simply saying um, this legislation has been proposed. It's got two components to it. Um, the first is to wind down the horses, and the second is to replace them with electric vehicles. And um, and I see that more hands are going up. Let me just say that um, Elizabeth had suggested some really interesting options for you know what we could do with the horses, ways to get them off the streets, some other stuff like that. And um, and I, I give her credit for trying to trying to get that woven in here tonight. Um, what I would recommend is that we simply vote on this resolution the way it's written, and um, which is to respond to those two components in this existing legislation. And then to come back in future months and talk about all those other great ideas, but to decouple it. Now, if you want to, if you really want to separate these two, you can do it preservation style, the way we do in the preservation committee, which is, you know, you can vote on whether or not you want to support the ban for the electric vehicles, and you can vote on whether or not you want to support winding down the horses. But I would say, since Arena and Ken and I all agree on something, and it's now 933, I would say, for God's sakes, people, just vote on it and move on. <laughs> I've even got Ken laughing. Please, Jay. I, Susan, I've been known to laugh. I'm going to call on Jay, but if you say anything to reckless moment, I'm going to kill you. No, no, I looked out the window to see if the world was shaking because I agree with Ken also. Okay, I'm going to call for a vote. Andrew Richie, do you have something quick to say? I do. And sorry to further complicate it. I don't want to tip my hand one way or the other, but why are we just not voting on supporting or not supporting this legislation? It seems exactly. to me that both the resolves make you take a moral position or a position on something that's a bit more complicated. Can we not just say that as drafted, we don't support this bill and vote one way or the other, but breaking it up into two just seems to force people to take positions on two okay. I'd be fine separate with that. issues. We don't support the bill. That's fine. I agree with Andrew. I agree. Kumbaya, let's vote on that. Okay. Uh, Barbara's hand is up. Barbara? Oh, no, I was just going to say I also agree with Ken. Oh, God, oh, please God. somebody call the question. I, and I was going to say, let's call the question. Call the question. Call the question. Okay, the question's been called. 
the resolution is going to be changed. Please trust me, we'll do this. I've been writing all the resolutions. I'll write this one too. Um, by the way, I didn't get to see either the Osprey or the Eastern Bluebird, which is in New York Actually, State. Actually, Susan, I drafted the resolution and we did decouple it. I I just want to be clear that we had decoupled it in the resolution in the way that it was written finally, and I'm going to support the resolution that you've put forward. So thank you. Great. Um, so the resolution will say that we do not support the, the legislation as proposed. Um, all those in favor? Oh, look at all the hands. You mean the, the bill is proposed? Just joint committee, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, joint committee. Okay. And we don't support the we don't support the. Are we doing the vote separately, parks? Let's do the vote separately. Let's do the park. Oh no, 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 I'm sorry. When you have a joint committee, you 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 take one vote of all joint committee members, and right. then you take a second vote of the members who are not of either of those committees, but are board members, and you only need a quorum of one committee. Although I think you have both. And Susan, we're voting. Just to be clear, we're voting yes if we oppose the legislation. Correct. Okay. So all those on the joint committee in favor of opposing the resolution. Opposing the Opposing the legislation. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just so overwhelmed that I can and I agree. <laughs> you know what I mean. Excuses, excuses. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Five, six, seven, eight. Oops, I forgot to raise my hand. 15. Okay, that's 15 um, of joint committee members. Um, and then those not in favor, those opposed to the legislation, raise your hand. In a favor of it. Good call, everybody. Uh, those abstaining, zero. And those for cause. Okay, so that's 15 to zero to zero to zero. And then um, those not on the joint committee in favor of opposing the legislation. That's four. Uh, those opposed? Hold on, hold on, let me. Catch up, Max. <laughs> I know, I'm trying, Susan. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Barbara, you're opposed. You're muted. Yes, opposed. So, but you're a committee member, you're a joint committee member. Yeah. Okay, this is for non-joint committee members. Oh, okay. Okay, so um, so should I go back and resolve, re, uh, revise the, the vote, Barbara? That's 15, 14 to one to zero to zero. Susan, can you finish up this vote first? Okay, the non-committee members, can you just finish up that? Oh, oh, thank you, Natasha, thank you. Um, no, so, Susan, no. you misunderstood me. When you said the legislation, which you did, I thought you meant the original legislation that that your that your resolution came from. I am very much in favor of the resolution that that you and Natasha wrote. Okay, great. So then I know what your vote is fine. Okay, so going back to the non-joint committee members, um, those opposed, nobody, those abstaining, nobody, those for cause, nobody. Okay. Shall we thank you very much. So the resolution uh, passes unanimously. Um, 15 committee members Joint committee members in favor and four non-committee members in favor. And um, everyone wave goodbye because this is the last time you'll ever see all of us agree on something. But don't go away. The meeting's not over yet. Uh, let's move on to new business. Is there any new business? Um, I don't know if he is still here. Peter Arnston from the bid in the northern part of our district. Are you here? And would you like to introduce it? Uh, he wasn't sure if I wasn't sure if he was going to stay through the whole meeting or not. I, and, and I actually have an item that I'd like you to to bring to bring up now for discussion, perhaps next month. Sure. Hope perhaps we can go to Arena first while we wait for Peter. Okay. So um, I, I I raised this at the transportation committee meeting. I don't know if uh, parks committee members have noticed that um, um, many of the food carts. Um, that are supposed to be removed at the end, at end of the evening are now staying uh, permanently overnight around Central Park. And not something we need to discuss tonight, but I would like to ask if the Parks Committee um, could have um, a representative from the concessions 
um, department at parks uh, come to the next meeting just to explain what the policy is about the food cards. Um, they are basically permanent on uh, Central Park uh, at Merchant's Gate. They basically are blocking the main monument at um, at um, at Merchant's Gate. Um, they're there permanently. Um, they're also uh, now moving across Central Park South to 7th Avenue. Um, there are several of them that seem to be permanent along Central Park West and 5th Avenue. So I just would like to understand what the what the rules are. That's a great Cause, suggestion. Because I thought they were supposed to be moved at the end of the night. And, and I, I think... I think something has changed and we should just be aware of what the policy, what the policy is. That's a great suggestion. I, I hate to say this, but it sounds like it would be another, a rematch. It sounds like it's another joint transportation and um, parks committee meeting. I, I just, I wonder if B, this is, isn't this like more of a BCI situation? Oh, that's where I raised it. it. Wasn't at transportation. It was at BCI. I raised it at BCI, not at transportation, because the the carts are not in the street. They're actually on the sidewalk, on the park, on the park property. And I didn't raise it at transportation. I raised it at BCI, and it was suggested that I bring it up here. Okay. Well, we'll we'll figure out with Beverly's help um where it belongs. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Mark. I just want to throw in a word that um, uh, agreeing with Irena and adding that how in the world do they ever clean these things if they're sitting there overnight, which makes me think that maybe this is also an HHS, HHS issue. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. Gross. Beverly? Uh, hi. Um, yeah, the um, carts, um, in, if they are on the perimeter of the park, um, they may or may not be concessionaires of the park. If they are, clearly parks uh, department is gonna be the folks who can speak to you on that. Um, they may be the uh, disabled veteran um, uh, food carts. If they are, they don't have a agency relation with anyone. They're just um, as of right, basically uh, under state law. So um, I actually have a, um, a secret uh, um, source of information. My husband spent 12 years working uh, a, as an attorney uh, pro bono at the Parks Department after he uh, retired. So I will definitely uh, get you some information. Excellent. Thank you, Beverly. Yeah, I think I think it's um, I think it's under DPR. But thank you. Thank you so much. So if thank there's you. no other business, new, old, or otherwise. Um, do I have a motion to? Uh... I, I just I just want to thank Christina Hansen for staying on till so late. We are very appreciative. Thanks, and I appreciate you guys taking up the issue and um, Elizabeth's suggestions about you know in the future you know any other questions about the horses themselves separate from this ridiculous electric carriage thing. Uh, you know I'm always available and you know happy to continue the conversation. This will be going to full board. We might want to, Christina may want to come. Yeah, yeah, full board. Yeah, absolutely. That should definitely be taken for the future. It just was not really, you know, part of this right now. So thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. It looks like we're dropping off the numbers. Uh, motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Okay. You know, thank you, Natasha and Susan. Thank you. Great meeting. Daniela, you have a question? Well, might be too late, but I won't end the Zoom if she's, no, she stopped already. Okay. No. Wait, no, no, she's here. She's here. She's here. Do you have a question? No, I was just adjourning the meeting. Oh, <laughs> Getting the motion. Yeah. I'll, send you, I'll send you my late. minutes. You're you're like two hours too late. <laughs> oh, I know. I'll send you my minutes. Um, they may be. Thank you.